Five, four, three, two, one. You're in the right place. Flash. Online, on the web, and on air. All over the world. Talk radio. You hear us, we hear you. Yeah, good evening and welcome to the KTPF Community Talk Show. Live, on air, and online this Sunday. Expecting storm, wet in some places. Wet here. <laughs> Thankfully, not in the room. <laughs> okay, so good evening, everyone, and how are you? Andy's live, live at, at the, the bingo. bingo. <laughs> so, yeah. which bingo is that, Andy? Yeah, where are you? Mecca, um, Coral? No, not Coral. Be- oh, there is a Coral bingo. Um, Gala. Uh, where are you? They're at the Gala, Gala Basildon. Good old Gala. <laughs> and he said it's dry but windy. Uh, shall we do the link? <laughs> 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 oh, I don't know. Well, let's just see who is actually in the old um, hub at the moment, or rather in the chat room. We're in the hub. Right, okay. We have Ag- Haggis 4. It's all right. Poppy's changed her name to Poppy. Yeah, all right. <laughs> we have Haggis 4. Hello to Jim. Nice to have seen you yesterday. I hope you enjoyed your evening with you and Sue. Susie Q, 73. She's finally got sound. I'm assuming that's Sue Nally. If not, it's Sue Harrison. We'll find out in a bit. Uh, Poppy. Uh, hello, Poppy. Are you new? Um, or are you using a different pseudonym? Uh, nice to see you anyway. Uh, let's see. Who else have we got? Um, coming nice. down slowly. we got Mr. Andy. 707. Andy 707. Live at the gala. Nice technical talk. <laughs> Yep. Uh, Rake Debs and Lee's in there and as we said Ghost Rider 2873 is in the hub um, ok and right. Poppy says yes she's new she's new, well it's nice to see you in fact well we hope it's a it, it, it's a she with a name like Poppy yeah ok and um, yes it is Sue Nally nice to see you Sue Nally back on the show ok so as I say we've got a great line up for you tonight uh, Tony Toppin's back and um, and uh, we finally got Dr. Kieran O'Keefe. I put it on the um, team pa- on the team page on the uh, KTPF page um, group thing a couple of weeks ago. What would you ask? Um, you know, if we had Dr. Kieran O'Keefe on, and he's finally come back to us and given us a date, and he said he's going to be with us later on tonight, um, weather pending. But, so, uh, uh, and Andy was the only one that came back and said what he was going to ask. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and then somebody. I, said I don't think it's a very good question. Yeah, no, I don't either. <laughs> Nor did somebody else. <laughs> so, uh, but never mind. Uh, don't forget, as we said before, before the show started, if you do have any problems with the sound or, or with, you know, if it freezes or whatever, um, we'll try and move as much as possible <laughs> so you know that it's not frozen. But um, as I say, you know, um, uh, just refresh. And if if you, we go off altogether, we are subject to um, Americans, I'm afraid, and um, they run the live stream. So uh, we will get back to you as soon as possible. Um, but Andy wants to ask him if he thinks bingo is paranormal. LOL. <laughs> uh, only if Andy wins. <laughs> so, but, uh, but yes. Um, so, well, how's your week been? Uh, we was at um, our mystery location last night, wasn't we? Uh, yeah. Which was in the Blackburn Bolton area. It's a bit confusing actually because it's near Black. It's near Bolton, but it's got a Blackburn postcode. It's uh, right on the, I think it's right on yeah. the boundary, isn't it? Yeah, and uh, it was not a bad investigation, really, and um, we had a quite a few newbies, didn't we? Uh, most of them, to be honest. Yeah, I know. Um, For some reason, we had a house, house full of uh, paranormal virgins. Yeah, yeah, it was um, it was really good, and you found a secret bolt hole. We did. Found a secret we room. Did. Well, the, the, it did have a, a normal door. But yes, but it was room. behind tapestry. No, but there was there was the proper door. Yeah, but uh, not the one behind the tapestry. Oh right, that was just the way in because, ah. because the other one was locked. I see. <laughs> but uh, just to, um, I won't tell you where it is, but I'll give you a little bit of a clue. Um, there, there's a rumor that there are two skulls that were kept in the tower. 
okay and uh, when the t when they moved um the story goes that uh, there was a lot of poltergeist activity apparently um and uh they said that uh, they had to put them back you know to um uh to stop this so um you know it's um they've got one there still um and a bit and a bit yeah and apparently the one that they've got there um it says they say that uh, it's got to be kept on top of this bible with this goblet um that's just in case just in case yeah um then uh, as i say uh, it's um uh in particular the two ghostly men appeared to be dueling that you know the, these two skulls or something and uh, there's been quite a few bits of uh, paranormal activity there anyway um quite a few things happened last night nothing i would say was very um what's namey you know nothing bang 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 and what have you but um but as i say if you look on the uh, paranormal database it says the two skulls are currently stored in the towers because it is a tower you know this tower thing and when stored in previous places have been blamed for causing two ghostly men to appear and begin fighting paranormal activity is also attached to the story and a woman apparently dressed in a morning costume haunts the staircase of the tower and possibly the old path outside the tower the area outside the tower is haunted by a phantom coach as well so that's what was supposed to be in there last night what we're we talking about please read this you want me to read I, it out? I think the uh, I think the fa the phantom coach <laughs> hit the car. Blackpool Tower. No, it wasn't Blackpool Tower. <laughs> All right. So um, you want me to read this? According to the British Library Electronic Thesis Online Service, O'Keefe's October two thousand and four PhD thesis has the title "Assessing the Content of Advice from Practitioners Claiming Paranormal Activity." However, the adv advisors are listed neither in the records nor inside the thesis text itself. Okay. Well, Where it, is the thesis? Okay. I don't know. It, it does actually do... Uh, Courses and stuff. Test in... Uh, yeah. No, it, oh, it, it wow. actually tests uh, mediums and psychics in the lab. Right, I see. Who did he talk to? I don't know. We will have to ask him. <laughs> we will ask him. Remember that question. Copy and paste it back again, and uh, we'll uh, ask him when it comes up. Now, um, Jamie's popped his backside in. Hello there, Mr. Jamie, sir. <laughs> nice to see you again. Will you be bringing the rest of your ghost questers All in? the way from Naughty Ash. Naughty Ash. Somewhere up there, isn't it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> he's probably moaning me now because he doesn't come from Naughty Ash. No, he comes from Liverpool. Liverpool, so Liverpool. which I think we're going to be there on Wednesday. He, he's in Hoyden. We're going to be there on Wednesday at Liverpool. In the pool. Yes, we're doing a charity event, aren't we? Yeah, indeed. So for a place in Liverpool. So and next week, if it all goes well, weather permitting, yeah, and um, we'll see. And basically, um, what we'll do is, uh, if it all goes well on Friday night weather permitting because we've got we've been asked to do an outside event yeah um basically uh we will tell you more next week if it happens okay um because we don't really want to say too much because if it does happen because it's outside and in, in the public we don't want people turning up there um and they may hear it on the podcast okay so um uh, as i say we will let you know more next week but all i will tell you is it's to do with a murder Okay. Very old. A very murder. old murder. But we'll tell you more next week. Um, and uh, even if it don't come off, we'll still tell you about it. But uh, anyway, let's get on with tonight. Back to tonight. Um, David said, hi, Sue, Andy, Debs, and Jim Bob. Jim Bob. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, so, yes. What have we got in the old observation? observation. I'll leave it over to you, Steve. Okay. I'm starting this week with a... Uh, Couple of UFOs, uh, mainly because they're, they're they're reasonably local to us. The uh, lo the sighting was, first one was in Salford M six five LZ. Uh, the witness name was Dan. Uh, witness statement: I was walking home from work before I entered my home. I looked up into the sky to see the stars. It was a particularly clear night, and the moon was also very large on the horizon. 
As I did so, I saw three orange lights quite far apart from each other, travelling directly over my head. They were travelling on the same trajectory, almost as though they were in formation. They passed overhead without making a sound. The lights were not flashing, nor were they particularly bright. They were dull orange in colour. Squinting, I thought I could see a bluish hue behind them. However, I cannot guarantee I am correct in this, stating this. It was also difficult to estimate their height. However, it appeared to me as if they were within the atmosphere. Okay. Uh, as the lights travelled quickly overhead, I, I staggered to see the centre light change the trajectory significantly. Uh, not quite at right angles, but certainly at a speed which defied the momentum of its travelling speed. Uh, the centre light approached the light on its right side and then resumed the same angle of trajectory, flying alongside in a pair for some distance. I was about to lose sight of the three travelling lights again, and I saw the same light change its course rapidly, uh, again seemingly defying the momentum it had, to travel across the sky quickly to fly alongside the light that had been travelling on its left. Uh, I have no explanation of what type of flying object these three lights could have been. Uh, I thought at first they were meteors burning up in, in the atmosphere. However, the erratic movement of the centre light made me doubt this theory. Uh, due to their distance apart and speed, they could have been low-flying jets but there's, there's no sound at all. In addition to this, Salford doesn't see many jets. Right, well, Andy707 said, sounds like Chinese lan lanterns, and then went, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I will concur that Salford doesn't see many jets. No. And, uh, nor do we. No. And we're, we're not far from Salford, are we? No, we're not. I must admit, um, you know, there have been quite a few sightings around, haven't there? We haven't mentioned any, but there have been. Yeah. Um, and uh, we have the mention of Chinese lanterns now. Yeah, we, uh, they are being mentioned here. <laughs> uh, next <laughs> item, it just says Manchester, not sure where. Mm -hmm. uh, this was on the 8th of the 10th at 1am. Uh, and the witness name is Cam. Uh, witness statement, the other night I was in my friend's back garden smoking a cigarette, looking up at the night sky because we were always seeing moving lights and shooting stars. As I looked to my left, I saw 8 to 10 orange red lights flying in the sky. 100% not Chinese lanterns. I saw dozens of them. They were about 10 to 15 meters wide, were really low in the sky. Uh, most of them were flying in formation, but two of them were slightly behind the others, uh, flying side by side. Then after 30 seconds or so, two or three flew off. Uh, the rest went on in an opposite direction. I've never seen anything like this in my life. In my life, uh, uh, life, you mean? I, I gather that they're uh, <laughs> they're not very good at writing things, and I think they're a bit like me. Uh, and my friend was just looking at, at each other in shock at what we saw. Now, personally, reading that, uh, it just sounds like planes flying in formation. Yeah. And if yeah, you you were seeing them from behind, you you'd see mm. the lights, wouldn't you? From the yeah. angels afterburners. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. You've got to be careful because Manchester's got an airport anyway and, yes. you know, it doesn't have to be uh, commercial flights. Can it? it could be um, uh, private airlines and stuff like that. I mean, it could have been anything from, mm. uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know if we know whether there was a display on anywhere. Cause, uh, what, one o'clock in the morning? These things go on all sorts of times. Yeah, I suppose they? so. Okay, that's, that's it for the UFOs in this case. Uh, well, Jamie said we might see a few more tonight with light winds, uh, fl oh, I d high winds. Well, blowing the Chinese lanterns around. Uh, Chinese lanterns, maybe it might be blowing all the um, things off course up there. <laughs> all, all the UFOs. All the UFOs. Uh, this story is from uh, Glasgow, Scotland, on the SB Wire. Oh, hi, Jimmy. Uh, it was printed on the uh, 21st of the 10th this year. And it says, until some years ago, very few people knew anything about psychics. Mm -hmm. Too many psychics uh, were gypsy-looking people with headscarves and large earrings who practiced in local fairs and in holiday resorts during the summer. Uh, psychics are often also clairvoyant mediums and sometimes you can see advertisements for them in the press 
which advertise the fact that they're performing a f for a few nights quite often in large cities like Glasgow, Manchester, London, New York, Los Angeles, and the likes. Pop music. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no. Go on. She's going back to her childhood there. <laughs> uh, when the public saw these efforts, they flocked in their hundreds to, to see if the psychics or mediums uh, could help them contact someone dear to them who had departed this earth. In more recent years, the image of psychics has changed, and many are turning uh, to them for help and advice when they have worries or problems of any kind. Mm. This has been made easier as many psychics, even those who are very well known, can be contacted by psychic texts. Yeah. I've not heard that one before, have you? No. Uh, uh, psychic instant messaging, oh, or so. simply by lifting the phone to contact help in this very modern manner. It is even possible to get advice and comfort via psychic spells. I keep getting links for psychic spells. Can we reciprocate? <laughs> no, go away. <laughs> <laughs> Not our thing. Uh, people make use of these practices for all sorts of reasons, such as receiving comfort when they lose someone they love, to getting advice about their future. Jobs, prospects, and to obtain advice about whether they should marry their partner or not, to simply finding a lost pet or a lost ring. Mm. However, psychics are using their powers for even more serious reasons, and their services are now being sought out by the police to help find missing persons or even to help solve murders. Even though they oh. won't admit it. No, or as they're saying in Scotland, there's been a murder. Oh, hang on, you jump, that jumped too far. Hang on, come back. Come back, there we go. Uh, this has been a fairly common technique in the, in the USA, where many police forces in large cities have uh, brought in psychics and clairvoyants, and in many cases they have helped the police find the remains of murder victims, as well as helping to solve the murder cases and to find those who committed these dreadful crimes. I think they do it more in America and They do, but they, they still, do don't say, still don't no. uh, openly say they've, they've used the psychic. Because I'm sure I read, read somewhere that they used the psychic to catch the Boston Strangler. Uh, I couldn't confirm I that think, one. I think that was in the film. It could be. Pardon, Steve? I can't, I can't con confirm that one. What's he pardoning at? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on some occasions, the results obtained by psychics have been much happier for when, for example, psychics helping the police in Florida helped them find a girl who had been missing for 10 years. She was found alive and well in a home where she had been reasonably well cared for, but was extremely glad to be found as she had been missing her family so much. She and her family are now re reunited and extremely pleased to be back together again. Uh, all thanks to the power of the psychics. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, yeah. in another case uh, concerned a famous psychic who discovered the mass graves of six teenage boys who had been missing for two years uh, in a very strange case in middle America. Uh, now in the UK, several police forces are now turning to psychics uh, to help in cases of missing persons and murders. Psychics have certainly come a long way and are now providing a very useful uh, for e even the most important subjects. Be yeah, an interesting question to ask Kieran. Mm. Whether he thinks that psychics can help in uh, this sort of thing, I wonder. What his opinion would be. A bit controversial. I, I personally would be uh, a bit nervous about uh, Maybe not. offering Maybe not. what <laughs> I was getting, you know. Oh. Uh, here's one for you. Michael Jackson's psychic predicted her own death. Oh. Uh, Ginny Elaine, most famously the psychic of Michael Jackson, correctly predicted her own death in Los Angeles area. Uh, Claire Vance said that she would die of liver disease. Our pal Dr. Susan Yassen said during her eulogy for Lane. It's tragic. Ginny uh, had predicted her own passing. And on this occasion, I hoped her prediction would be wrong, mm -hmm. Jasin said. After Jacko's passing in 2009, uh, Lane finally opened up about her lengthy sessions with Michael, uh, was a very sensitive guy and would hate uh, what was usually written about him, especially around the time of his, of his trial for child abuse in 2005. Mm. Uh, one thing he seemed to lack was the one thing money couldn't buy, genuine friendship. Yeah. Lane 53 spent her final months 
uh, in a place of birth in South Wales. Mm. Okay. And how many more you got? I I got the thing about the sun. You got a few bits away. Okay, just wondering, just looking at the time. Okay. I'll I just let you know that we've had a few remarks here. Um, Balloon says John over in the corner there as well. Saw one at the outside the other day. Uh, Andy said, "Do you believe in nuts and bolts of UFOs?" I don't know what that's all about. Uh, he'll, have, he'll have to explain that one later. Um, and Sue saying she's received the same request on her page, I think. Um, Andy's finally found O'Keefe's thesis. Um, and Sue said she has experienced some people quite nas- being quite nasty about true mediums. Um, but, uh, you know... Uh, there have been a few things on Facebook of late, hasn't there? Quite a few people have been attacked. Um, uh, loads of people have been attacked. Including today. ourselves <laughs> of well, re- recent uh, times. Well, a, but, a, um, a couple of comments about us have been made, but yeah. that, that was it. Yeah, and but there's been... I noticed in the same week, it must have been a bad moon or something. Mind you, it was, this, it was the, um, the when the moon was doing the old uh, fall thing on that night wasn't it it was that week just last week I think it was and there was a lot of people um, commenting on Facebook how karma's going to get them back and all this that and the other yeah and we uh, there, were, there were at least six that we heard of yeah uh, that was having problems one way or another and yeah asking karma to do the old retribution yeah I'm hoping karma gets our retribution to whoever but uh, uh, we, I, we've been we've been looking at mirrors haven't we I just I, <laughs> I just say good luck to them. Yeah, well, this is uh, it. But let's, uh, let's, let's get this out of the way. Let's go on to the, the sun erupted with two of the strongest solar flares it can unleash Friday, just days after blasting an intense solar storm at Earth. Uh, the sun fired off a flare that registered at uh, X1.7 on the space weather scale mm-hmm. at uh, 4.01 a.m. ET and 8.01 GMT Friday, then followed with the next two class event. At uh, 11.03 or 15.03. What day was this? Our time. This was on Friday. That was the same day as... No, it's all right. It's Friday just gone, wasn't it? Yes. All right, okay. Yes, Friday just gone. Okay. Uh, and, and then followed with two class. Uh, NASA Solar Dyn- Dynamics Observer captured, uh, uh, which came with several smaller sunstorms over the last few days. Both powerful flares erupted uh, from a new sunspot cluster called Region 1882 and sparked uh, temporary radio blackouts. Offici- officials from the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration Space Weather Prediction Center said an update, but uh, neither eruption is likely to spark major geometric storms on Earth. This magnetic field, they added. Now, the, the Quite a bit of stuff then that uh, most people wouldn't bloody uh, understand. understand. But uh, like me. But what? Yeah, me. <laughs> uh, but what I will, I will uh, does, does come to mind is that uh, that happened on Friday. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden, we're expecting a, a massive storm here in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like Andy says, it's autumn. It always goes weird in autumn. <laughs> so, well. But, uh, because uh, we don't use, we've not been getting a lot of uh, observe, uh, observations. Uh, do we have a few minutes? What's that, darling? Do we have a few minutes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like I said, because we've not been getting a lot of observations, and most of the news that's coming through is like two years old. Mm. Uh, I thought I would, uh, I would do a haunted house. Oh, go on then. Oh, every so often. Go on uh, then. Athelhampton House in Dorchester. Uh, the house has been witnessed its uh, its fair share of history, having been built over five centuries ago, in 1485 by Sir William Martin. Uh, the house stayed in the Martin family for over four generations until 1891, when it was sold to Alfred Cart de la Fontaine. Uh, he set about restoring the house in its grand past. He also had the formal gardens created, which you can see today. In 1957, the house was bought by uh, Robert Victor Cook, who in 1966 passed Athelhampton uh, on to his son, Sir Robert Cook, MP. The current owners of the house are Patrick and his wife, Andrea, uh, Sir Robert's son and daughter-in-law. Now, that's a 
brief history there. Now we have the ghost of Wolverhampton House. Go on then. Uh, it's considered to be one, one of the most haunted houses in England. And I did find it on, find it on the top ten. Yeah. Uh, it played host to Living TV's Most Haunted Crew for one of their uh, first episodes. Right. Uh, one report that stands out at this location is the pair of duelists in the Great Chamber. Mm. Uh, one day a woman was trying to relax and read a book in the Great Hall when two unknown men burst into the chamber in the middle of a sword <laughs> fight. Okay. That's taking three days to... <laughs> yeah, it is a bit. <laughs> Especially if she was reading about it. Yeah. Uh, the woman con- continually pulled on the bell rope for the servants, but nobody arrived. Mm. She turned to her side and carried on reading while the fight continued until one of the men uh, were cut on the arm and left the room. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> uh, later that day, the woman reported the incident to the owner, and he replied, puzzled at the whole thing. He stated, I cannot understand who the men were uh, you had seen. As as all the guests in the hotel were here at tea, so you would so you would have seen them. Still to this day, the, the two men have never been identified, although yeah. the house is believed to have had connections to the royalists during the Civil War. Uh, the wine cellar adjoins the Great Hall, and he said to experience tapping from a ghost known as Cooper. Mm-hmm. Uh, various owners, staff, guests of uh, Applehampton House. I've uh, I've seen what only can be described as guess what, ladies, a grey lady. Oh, another one. They have a grey lady. The current owner of uh, Applehampton, uh, Mr. Robert Cook, has reported seeing her in the early hours passing through the walls in the bedrooms. Right. Uh, a dark apparition that looked like a monk has been seen by one of the housemaids uh, in the broad daylight. Uh, the woman became aware of footsteps behind her in one of the corridors. She quickly turned to see the monk standing outside the bathroom door. It is believed that this person was a Catholic priest to the Martin family. Uh, perhaps the most well-known ghost of them all is the pet ape, which was accidentally entombed in a secret passage behind the great chamber. Yeah. Though the ghost has never been seen, you can often hear it scratching from the panels of the great chamber as it tries to escape. Mm. So that is uh, interesting. Applehampton Hall. People saw monkeys last night as well. We did. We did see monkeys. I don't know why. I don't know. Either, but um, I don't know. Uh, well, and has, he's. Has anybody out there uh, actually uh, actually know of uh, Applehampton Hall? I'm not sure. That's spe- that spelled A T H E L Hampton. Yes. Going back to um, that's been on TV. Um, going going back to uh, what Sue was mentioning, um, when it comes to um, animosity, the best 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 thing to do is to let them play their own games and just ignore it, isn't it, really? Exactly, Don't retaliate. That's exactly what we did. That's what we and did. We just let them get on with it. Yeah. So um, that's what it's all about, keeping the paranormal friendly and uh, uh, basically um, that's what we do. Uh, yeah, uh, what's this... Uh this link that Andy's put on there. He's put on the thesis for people to look at. Oh, right. Okay. So, right. Well, the man is ready. Not Dr. O'Keefe, but... Um, uh, Mr. Topping. Yes, Mr. Topping. Mr. He's, Tony. He's ready for us to contact. So... Uh, Where are we going, him? Let's go and speak to him. Here we go. I think that was quite good. That I actually picked, I actually picked one that was on their mates and didn't realise. Yeah. Well, we're hoping to be calling. So, not a lot's happening at the moment. Are you going to ring or not? Or are you just going to sit there? Speak to us, Mr. Topping. Where are you? Play the game. Hello. What's happening here? It's not even ringing. <coughs> try one more time. Is Skype playing games? Here we go. We'll try again. Dunk, 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 dunk. Just wait for a <coughs> There we go. Here we go. So we can get hold of the man. Ah, oh, good evening, Kate CPF. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. How are you, my darling? Yes, I'm all right. How are you? Not too bad, yeah. not too bad. What have you been up to, Tony? Oh, are we on air? We are indeed. Can you hear me, Tony? <laughs> oh, hello. Yes, <laughs> yes. I thought we might have been off air. Yeah, hello, good evening. Yeah, no, I'm fine. Thank you. Well, 
Uh, what have I been up to? It's always nice to uh, appear uh, with with you guys on the show. I've got my own. I'm a presenter myself now. Uh, I've got my own uh, show called the Tony Topping Show and something called Breaking the Matrix, which is a current alternative affairs show on the Planet X platform. Yeah. And we've, we've done all kinds of television work, I think, since I last spoke to you, including this morning on Channel 5. Uh, we've had a few production companies come our way, but it didn't quite, uh, including Daybreak, but they were, they wanted me on the program, but they were a bit busy with getting a pop band on there, so they couldn't have me on. So, but that's how it goes, you see, with the, yeah. with the editorial. So, the, but the, you know, so media wise, uh, we're doing okay, and, um, UFO wise, we've had some extraordinary situations occur, uh, in the private war that is, uh, going on with me. We've seen Edward Snowden in the media, and he has certainly put the cat among the pigeons with the, uh, with the NSA revelations, and, uh, you know, people spying and all that kind of thing. And my little issue goes a bit beyond the, the surveillance state of tapping your phone. Um, and all that kind of thing. It goes a bit beyond that. This is about tapping the mind. Yeah. And so for that, for that reason, uh, as you well know, I had to study espionage at all levels, mm -hmm. which is very handy to know because it means that when some media smart ass turns around to me and says, well, uh, did people in, let us say, I don't know, XYZ agency target me? And because I know how it all works, we can safely say that there's something out there uh, within the national security apparatus that has gone uh, mission creep, absent without leave, and is targeting people's minds with advanced technology. And of course, the messenger's going to get shot at. And, um, you know, this happened a few weeks ago where we had an incident with my friend who was a radio ham, and I was on the VHF radio to him, and we had this strange incident happen where I went missing for 10 minutes, but yet, it only appeared as if I was there all the time, but he said he'd been calling me on the radio for 10 minutes. Yeah. Uh, and he wondered where I'd gone and what happened was this object had come over the top of me. And it was like a big triangular shape thing. At first I thought it was two geese for some, for some bizarre reason. Yeah. And, it, you know, and they slowly came over, two little diamond ships slowly came over. And then the next minute, you know, uh, it speeded up to a tremendous speed and then merged into three into a very large triangle and flew up into the clouds. The cloud base is about a thousand feet. So, um, um, I don't quite know what's happened other than the fact that I think possibly something did happen. And my mate was trying to contact me on the radio and it was witnessed, oddly enough, by another radio ham who saw this, saw this strange object. Uh, I've not been quite the same since, and the psychic attacks have been rather heavy going. It's been quite exhausting. Uh, and it's uh, now on my radio show, the Tony Topping Show. We, we've covered all aspects, all guests, all aspects, very in-depth, very deep. But we've also covered the areas of mind control and espionage. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that's... Um, that's really what's uh, what's going on at the moment. So it's like a there's a very real awakening and war out there going on between covert forces that the public don't see. Yeah. Uh, not only is there a war on terror and terrorism going on and and all the crazy hell that happens with all that, but there is a there are elements I do believe it, that are completely out of control with technology in their hands that should have oversight but doesn't, and uh, that's very worrying. It's very worrying indeed. What can we do about it then? Well, I think that as as, um, as Eisenhower said, there is a there is a rising only a knowledgeable and alert citizenry uh, can uh, what's the word I'm looking for stand against such an onslaught of unaccountability. Uh, and my governments and the U.S. governments and other governments and their associated agencies do know this is going on, but it's as if uh, somebody's lacking the backbone to to stand up for it. And, uh, you know, I was targeted on a number of occasions on my radio show. I've got the, I've got a film coming out next month on YouTube called Alienated. Uh, it's done with a company called Filter View Films, starring me and a cast of thousands. Uh, it's, just, it's not just about me, although the film company said they might actually come back and do a full blown one on me because uh, there's that much, there's that much material. But, uh, basically I take the film crew through what it's like, uh, the locations in the town where I was covertly and overtly followed. Uh, by certain individuals, and I take them, I walk them through what that was all about, and it's turned into a very. I, I describe myself as a paranormal Jason Bourne, somebody who's you know from the Bourne idea, another Bourne identity, where somebody's trying to find their paranormal idea. I'm trying to find my paranormal identity, and I describe myself as, as somebody like that who's seen these perpetrators, look them in the eye, um, and it's kind of like um, it's interesting to note that they are out there. And uh, if anybody would like to know uh, a bit more about them, if you look at the film, there's a film uh, called Smoking Aces, 
and there's a, an actor in that film called Nesta Carbonell. He's a very well-known actor, bloody fine actor. This is obviously nothing to do with him whatsoever. However, the character he portrays in the film Smoking Aces, there's one character with a moustache uh, in there, and he is the absolute look-alike of one of the perpetrators that followed me. The absolute look-alike. And really, what I'm planning to do is I'm planning to do an Interpol-style type photo fit of him and sticking a ball over the internet. Um, just on purpose, frankly, uh, because uh, this is... This is, uh, has made me very angry and I've awakened for some reason with it all. I've actually, the lights have come on with it. Uh, and so, you know, this is the, a world that people don't see. And if you look in the, uh, I, I referenced the Jason Bourne films again, there's that very famous, the third one, uh, which I think is the, uh, the Ball Supremacy, the Bourne Ultimatum. The, there's one in particular. I, I'm not using Jason Bourne as if I'm some fantasy character. It's a very important marker to watch because there's this famous scene in the, in the, one of the Bourne movies where there's a Guardian journalist who twigs on the mind control program that's been run, which is called Treadstone. And there's this uh, very powerful scene. It's I think it's the opening scene where Jason Bourne's on Waterloo Station trying to make this journalist. And the uh, the CIA uh, are on to this. And there's this brilliant display of mindset. That, that kind of like the mindset from the agents who, who are after him. It's, it's, a, it's a mindset the like of which you, you just cannot comprehend the mindset of psychopathy and barbarity and it kind of like shows it very nicely what's happening you've got in that scene in that opening scene you've got uh, an illegal agency operating on united kingdom soil stalking a british journalist without oversight or anything i don't know whether you've seen the opening scene and it's it's a mindset that that i wasn't prepared to deal with when it happened to me so hence me really knowing my onions on espionage and, and paranormal espionage yeah yeah it, it it conjures up ideas of when they people used to say putting tin foil on your head. <laughs> yeah, well, you see, that's the that's the smart ass mainstream media view of that. And if yeah. any smart ass presenter comes out with that remark, they'll get scalped. Yes. Uh, because it's, 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 I didn't it's, say it. I didn't say it. No, no, you're all right, honey. It's it's something that I'm I'm very strongly uh, against because I I know that um, that I know there are some courageous journalists in Britain who who are out there who uh, who will probably yeah. They may go down that route of the tin foil hat brigade, but when you've got the research to hand, and when you when you know your onions, you know that yeah, okay, there are people out there. Who, I mean, I, for example, stand outside my local Tesco's, yes. uh, speaking to aliens with a tin foil hat on my head. Mm -hmm. um, now that that what I've just said could be edited now, couldn't it, and used in the mainstream media? But the yes. the, the, uh, uh, the media only hear what they want to hear, including the BBC, who, who, who only hear what they want to hear as well. They don't, you know, and we need, we need some real challenging uh, journalists and understanding of would what is say, going on. Would you say it was a naivety of it all, that when they uh, come out with silliness like that? Uh, it's it, it is a naivety. It's actually a lack of uh, it's actually a lack of research really done yeah. by yeah. by some of the journalists. Who I mean, uh, for example, uh, you had uh, Jeremy Paxman interviewing Russell Brand on Newsnight recently, yes. um, and uh, Jeremy Paxman was talking about a, a democratic society, and we vote these people in while not seeming to understand the comments of Benjamin Disraeli that. Uh, that a centralised banking system is like having a standing army in your own country that is profiting from the public purse. It's mm -hmm. like having an invading army sat there in your own camp. Uh, that was his opinion on, on banks, on the mainstream banks like the Bank of England, the Bank of Spain, the Fed. Many presidents and many prime ministers have commented. But that went over Jeremy Paxman's head, because probably because... He didn't look at the research. No. So it's not because he's stupid. He just, he just didn't look yeah. at the research. And really, editorial teams and news teams are very busy people. And I've got to sum up a whole situation, perhaps, uh, in five minutes. Do you know what I'm saying? I've yeah. got to sum up the whole, the whole situation, point A to point B, um, in, five, in five minutes flat, you know, and that's not easy. Right. Well, um, I can assure you that my comment wasn't to offend you. It was just, you, Lovey, uh, you, <laughs> you're the least person to offend me, honey. You, you know, you as really I say, um, uh, it was a couple of bits that were mentioned in the chat room when they've been saying about certain films where they have had that thing on, you know. And yeah. So, yeah. but I yeah. just wanted you to put your point I'm a, across. No, I, I'm a pro. I'm a, I'm a pro at this, and uh, I've had to live with it for a very long time. And, and that, you know, also, as another thing I've been doing as a matter of interest, I've been a, con a creative consultant on a book called yeah. The Psychic Spy uh, that's been written by a former, well, we, she 
we can't say she is, we can't say she isn't, but she was involved, uh, so the story goes, in uh, in MI6 uh, operations to do with remote viewing. Um, so the story goes. Uh, and she wrote a book called The Psychic Spy, which is uh, one woman's tale of Great Britain's top secret psychic espionage program. Uh, and it was written by Irene Block. And I've been, been doing a bit of creative kind of guidance on that, uh, which has been uh, really good. And the book's turned out to be a great seller. It's one hell of a read. It really is. And that also shows the, the mindset of how uh, an innocent woman called uh, Eileen Evans was recruited into British intelligence in the 1970s, only to find that her mind would be pushed and pressured into doing things that she didn't want to do uh, and, and all that kind of thing. And it, it, it takes a unique and fascinating look into the little known kind of aspects of the world of psychic espionage, including what I didn't know to do with Falklands operations of, uh, during the Falklands War, MI6 using remote viewers to track the Belgrano, to do all this. To, I've never heard of that anywhere before, and I consider myself very clued upon remote viewing and all like that. So it, it's one hell of a book that she's written, and it really, really takes you into the kind of John Lee Carey world of the psychic spy. Uh, and, it, and she's been a bit, uh, even though it's a, it's the story based around the character, um, it's it's not been a, an easy ride for her, but she's eventually got the book out there, and it's a one hell of a read. Uh, and I, I liked it very much. So I've been working on that. I plugged her. I said I promised I'd give her a quick plug. I hope you don't yeah, mind. Not, not you might you might want her on the show at some point. Not but it's a an problem, excellent my love. Okay. Well, you're you're here tonight to talk to us about the British Occult Secret Service That's and it. the esoteric of 007. Yes, yeah, so. well, well, that's it. Well, well, I thought what I want, I mean, that, that's what we were going to talk about, but I mean, it always goes off piece, doesn't of it? Of course uh, it does. But uh, what is you know, that all about then? But, uh, well, I, I, I believe it started way back with John D. Yeah, yes, uh, John D. Actually, Sir Francis Walsingham, uh, it actually started with. He's the, he, he could be classed as the current M. Uh, you know what you see in the Bond movies. He could be, he could be actually classed as the uh, as the guy who uh, who founded the. And the reason why he founded them was only just because one of the at the time in the 1600s, uh, 1500s, should I say, one of the most powerful intelligence uh, agencies in the world was the Vatican. Uh, under the Spanish Inquisition, they had a very powerful intelligence agency uh, known as the not the Elements, the Sentinel. Oh, gracious me, what were they called? The Vatican's Intelligence uh, Service. The Entity. They were known as the Entity. And when it came to drug running and uh, liaising with the Nazis in World War II and doing this and being the great men, they really were, the Catholic Church really have a very powerful intelligence agency. And also, they say their intelligence saved the life of the um, Israeli Prime Minister, Goldie Mir. Uh, as well, and so back in those days, in the time of Walsingham, it was pretty, uh, pretty heavy going. He had to set up at like a, a counter spy agency, like a, a 1500 version of uh, of MI6. Uh, and since the, you know, Elizabeth I, the time of that, they, they, they've worked according to the principle, according to the head of Russia's Federal Security Service. They, they kind of like British services work to the principle of the ends justify the means. So it's money, bribery, blackmail. Uh, and these are their uh, recruitment uh, recruitment methods. Just going off piece, which might be of interest to your listeners, Anna Chapman. Uh, it was said that the Anna Chapman uh, spy ring was actually part of a top secret psychic espionage group called the Blue Star Group. Whether that's uh, whether that's true, I've I have no idea actually. But uh, uh, the rumor was that that is what was that was go what was going on. But I think occultism and espionage. Uh, you know, they, they, they work hand in, hand in hand with each other, don't they? The black art of espionage is always about obtaining secret information from psychics and astrologers. Um, and I, I know John D was actually classed as, as probably the the first 007 because Elizabeth I actually signed um, her documents 007. Uh, did you know that at all? No, no we didn't. didn't. Yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. The original James Bond, although some say it was another, uh, some there's a bit of an argument as to who the real James Bond was. Uh, some say it was Riley Ace of Spies, and others say it was uh, John D. But in John D. There is evidence because Elizabeth the first would sign the documents 007. And it, 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 you know, in the early days, the father of the British Secret Service at that time was indeed, um, he was a spy master called uh, Sir Francis Walsingham, a Protestant, and he, he was kind of, he was, 
He, he escaped perse persecution and uh, in exile he learned Italian and French and he, he became, a work, uh, became acquainted with the work of the famous Phoenician Secret Service at the time. And it's interesting to note that uh, he, he, at that time he knew uh, about the use and deployment of psychic spies to gather intelligence. There was one thing he did, uh, a famous thing where John Dee kept having repeated dreams that the, I think it was the French or the Spanish, or the, the Spanish had infiltrated uh, a boatyard, let us say, somewhere in the middle of Essex it was, and they were all in disguise, and, and um, John Dee kept having repeated dreams about this, that they were all in disguise, um, and so Walsingham went in, and, and it was correct as well, they, they, it actually was correct, that was going on, they, they had infiltrated this boatyard to do acts of sabotage, um, and they'd been arrested, so that was quite correct, also Sir Francis Drake as well, it came into him in a dream, as to how to uh, stop the Armada. Should I say John Dee had the vision of how to stop the Spanish Armada. And there was massive, um, massive uh, spells with Francis Drake, who was kind of like, I think, near the English Channel, conducting spells in a, in a cloak of secrecy to push the Armada back. I think what fascinates me the most is, is actually Dion Fortune. And it, she really does fascinate me. I, I, in 1570, um, Walsingham was the new ambassador to France. He set up this massive spy um, spy network that, that that actually had links into a guy called Cecil Williamson, who worked for British intelligence during World War Two. And they British intelligence have always used psychic spies. They've used witches and psychic spies, and the CIA did as well in the 1950s. Before they even used remote viewing in the 1970s, the CIA used something called MK Often. Uh, because often we are near our goals and often we are not, hence the term MK often. So in the 1950s, they were using uh, something called, um, they were using something called MK often, and they were using psychic spies because um, they were having an air war with UFOs, and they were trying to fathom out why these UFOs were coming in over America in 1952. And why they were being, why they were having to shoot them out the sky, and the conclusions were quite startling. And that's under the word, the excellent work of Nick Redfern, and, and we discovered something called the Collins Elite, which is something I often talk about, which not a lot of people know about. And that was like a super secret psychic spy agency attached to, uh, is it Nellis AFB or Williams AFB? One of them. It was attached to an air force base, mm. and the rumor is, is that to, to, to this day the Collins Elite are still active, still looking at the occult connotations behind UFOs uh, and all that kind of thing, uh, which I find just, just absolutely fascinating. Was I talking about Dion Fortune? You mentioned the name, yes. Yeah, Dion Fortune, again, she was absolutely tremendous, because what she did is she had these massive psychic kind of visions, um, uh, visualizations to protect England. Uh, uh, the I've read some of the visualizations that she did, but she established a whole network of psychics to deter... Uh, Germany from invading Britain. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the SS were trying to do the opposite, and it is said that some of the 1970s uh, remote viewing programs uh, came from the SS, uh, uh, special departments in the in Himmler's occult kind of circle, special units. Uh, and it is said that the American remote viewing programs actually stem from there. Although I can't see any provable evidence that that was the case, yeah. you know. But but Dion Fortune definitely um, did a lot to try and deter Hitler from invading. And it, I understand somebody came up to me at a UFO conference and, and said that one of her relatives uh, had actually gone to Ashdown Forest because Ashdown Forest was a well-known place that Crowley went to with a circle of people. Yeah. And they were also casting spells to deter Hitler from invading Britain. Uh, according to this lady at the conference, her relative uh, attended Ashdown Forest with Crowley and joined in these um, seminars, these uh, scenarios uh, that's been uh, documented on the uh, on the internet. Isn't it incredible? Yeah, uh, is that Alistair Crowley you're on about? Yeah, Alistair. Yeah, it's 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 Alistair. Uh, yeah. It's Alistair, uh, Alistair okay. Crowley. Yeah, okay. but it's uh, John D. Who we can pin as as the as the actual uh, guy who was the double O uh, the double O seven definitely. Right. Okay. Uh, Tony, I, I have a I have a question for and, and I wasn't going to ask it now, but uh, her name's come up on the on the chat room. Uh, do you think, like me, that not only was the uh, the Helen Duncan case a travesty, but completely mishandled uh, and could have been used to the country's advantage, and also that her, her family deserve an open apology? 
Right, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I would be lying to you if I said I, I may have come across the Helen Duncan case. I'm not quite familiar with it, um, Helen Duncan. Uh, I'm not quite familiar with that. If, if, if I tell you a little bit about it, you, you might remember. Uh, right. She, she was doing a, a seance, and she uh, she had a sailor come to her, uh, basically from a ship that uh, hadn't been reported sunk. Right, and uh, obviously the uh, the MOD as such would, would keep the MOD were keeping that quiet, and uh, obviously it got out, and she was basically arrested and charged with witchcraft. Right, it's part of your um under the witchcraft act. Rudolf right. Hess and the British occult connection. It's the last paragraph where Is it mentions it really? yeah that it, it was yeah. also claimed that Ian Fleming and the NID was involved in a plot to silence. Mm. Helen Duncan. Yeah, she was. Right. Uh, she was actually imprisoned uh, right up until after the war. Yes, I, I'm reading it now, and I think I think just bringing that up to current speed. What is uh, what is of concern at the moment is, of course, developments in the terrorism act, where alternative media presenters like myself, who are into this big style, uh, who are very well known for for what we know, being possibly taken away. Do you get me saying being questioned under the Terrorism Act for some bizarre... You just don't know what they're doing with all these acts that are coming in. Uh, here, here, it could, you, know, you could have a scenario developing where we've got people like David Icke suddenly carted off, or myself suddenly carted off for questioning, uh, because obviously we're a bit, uh, just a bit too hot to handle with what we're coming out with, which is totally wrong, of course, isn't it? Mm. I'd love to get David Icke on the show. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, exactly. And, and it's, it, at the end of the day, they tried it on with Lord Mockton, Lord Christopher Mockton. They, they had a go at him about it all. Mm. He was coming out with things that might, might rock the boat, sir. But you see, the only boat that we're rocking is, is, is perhaps the fact of the disgusting goings on in this country that we're seeing at the moment, which I strongly believe have a paranormal hand to it. I do not believe for uh, for a minute that this is all uh, this is all not unintentionally orchestrated, uh, and that's a very serious uh, issue. And I do think, from my studies of espionage and psychic espionage, that um, there is an unseen hand and some sort of bizarre covert war going on. Yeah, I do uh, honestly think there's some sort of covert war going on that we are not aware of as the public. Yeah, uh, just to qualify for uh, our, our listeners, uh, when we say a cult here, we're, we're talking mediums and psychics, and not. Yeah, uh, and not witchcraft, as no. uh, as de deployed all over the media. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's right, isn't it? The esoteric. But you see, what is interesting about that is you could have a guy I don't know interviewing me, for example, who's telling me that I'm the oddball, I'm the tin foil hat wearer. Uh, but yeah, he's a very high ranking guy who was uh, under the ceremony of Freemasonry, born again in a very odd ceremony that I, f I find it odd. They're free to worship, but they're free to do what they want to do. But I, I just personally just just find that odd that they they don't come out with that they don't mention that do you get me drift yeah uh, yeah there's uh, a, we've got a, a statement on the um uh, well a statement a remark on the chat room by susie q73 uh, susie yeah q73 she said she's astonished at what she's hearing uh, and she thought uh, the single-minded ideas from a hundred years back had been over with the, the, the what, sorry? The, the single-minded ideas from one hundreds of years back um, had been over with, but obviously not. What does she What does she mean by that question, or am I being a uh, bit slow? What does no, she mean she by that? She basically means about the way people were one hundred years ago. We're still being like it now. Yes, we are. Yeah, yeah, we we are. We've still got the divisions of uh, of religion going on. Uh, we've still got the divisions of... Uh, we're being played like a fiddle. Uh, I think the human race is being played like a fiddle, and I think the U.S. intelligence community in the 1950s, uh, via their research uh, into into psychic espionage, twigged on this. So, if they twigged on it, then where are they at? Where are they with it now? Uh, but meanwhile, we've got this big who are in the press about Snowden and the NSA and uh, tapping phones and all this kind of thing. But with that research that I'm talking about in the 1950s, where are they with it now? Is yeah. the uh, is the question either they're somewhere or there's some hidden hand that has a um, what's the word I'm looking for? A complicit interest in keeping in keeping these ideas, as that lady has said from a hundred years ago, in full check. Yeah, Jamie from Ghost Quest said basically they're treating us like idiots, to be precise. Yeah, that they are. They are treating uh, treating people like uh, like yeah. idiots, and uh, the British people just seem to just roll over. Don't they? they just seem to have their tummies tickled uh, mm -hmm. and just roll over and take it. The people of Iceland and Ireland currently aren't standing for the banking uh, the banking shenanigans, but the people of Britain can just be warts all over. We, quite we, we seem to be um, 
when we look at Greece and that going up in arms and, and, and places like that and Syria because they don't like the way they're being treated, we seem to be a bit of a civil country, but maybe too civil. Yeah, I think we're I think we're a nation with no with no real backbone anymore. I mm. think we are a nation that that just kind of um, you know controversial it is of me to say, but we we are a, a nation I think that's lost its uh, that's lost its backbone. I mean, I don't I don't get, for example, and this could be controversial, but I don't get that the two young members of the royal family, uh, Princess Diana's uh, sons, um, her their mother would be in outrage at what she is seeing today. But what we're seeing is. Uh, it's just them swanning around and uh, all's well in the world. Uh, but this right. country is going on its knees, and I think it's all wrong. Okay, Steve, carry on with your questions. Yeah, uh, being, if, and I don't disbelieve what you say, we are you using mediums and psychics, uh, so, then so are the other sides. So it then becomes not how to get information, but how to stop them getting the information. How do yeah, you think, the, how do you think yeah. they do that? Yeah, well, this is this is what when, in the night from the research I've read, and, it, and I, I did it on a recent radio show actually, uh, and it went down a storm on one of my radio shows called the, which is called the Tony Topping Show, and uh, it's on the Planet X Live uh, platform. We did it. I did a show just recently that went down a storm that discussed about something where they discovered uh, they discovered uh, Linda Moulton Howe in her book. Uh, High Strangers Volume 1 had been approached by uh, some officials from the Defence Intelligence Agency. Uh, but the reason for this was because she'd obviously written about something and she wasn't aware of the implications of what she'd said. And they came across her and they said that uh, they were dealing with something called non-human entities or, or NHE. And they were saying that they, it was quite um, it was quite a disaster for them because they said the other side, as that person's quoted, uh, was were particular dab handers at giving the illusion that they were winning. When in fact, it's this famous and I think Whitley Stryber came out with this remark that you you pick a fight with the greys and they don't just let you win and let you lose; they just drag it on and on and on. And that uh, this seemed to be what happened with Linda's book. And then along came uh, Nick Redfern's book, Final Events, where the same thing comes up again this time where a vicar was approached by uh, agents from the defense intelligence agency to discuss non-human entities and what he thought of the demonic and the occult under the umbrella of the collins elite something's going on where some somebody somewhere has detected a clear threat a clear threat to to the human race that's not necessarily alien in the sense that we would think but has been around us for a very very long time indeed and for some of us this work is highly dangerous it's highly dangerous uh, i think for some of us um this work that we do uh, for alternative media presenters for some of us like like i am it's highly dangerous work uh, because we we seem to know the lay of the land we're, we're up against a doubting media uh, but a very supportive public uh, it surprises me the number of lads in this town when i go into my pub who you would at first glance you wouldn't believe it but they'll wander over have a chat with you about it all and then just go back to their mates as if nothing happened, and they're plumbers, they're accountants, they're people who, who wouldn't come out with it in public, but they'll come up to me and say, sorry, this is bloody super stuff, I'm really into this, but I don't really want to talk about it in public, and my yeah. mates, this, that, and the other. It goes on, people are informed more than we would think. Yeah, this is it. A uh, couple of questions in the, um, uh, in the chat room. Who is the other side, and where do you actually find your info, Tony? Uh, well, my info is based on, on, on 30 years um, experience and observation of my own experiences meshed with research from other people. So um, that's that's where my info comes from. It's about the paranormal identity. It's about myself trying to find out why I had, for example, uh, regular awakenings at quarter to six in the morning with an alarm clock ringing in my head. Uh, why I was being awoken at three o'clock in the morning with gunfire in my head. Why I saw a guy in a pub when I walked past him, he mentioned discreetly to the female colleague he was with uh, that I was doing what I did again in reference to uh, what they were doing to me. Only he would know that part of the conversation. I now know who he is. Yeah. Um, I know him. I, I just uh, and I, I refer you back to the smoking aces look-alike guy. Um, and that may seem odd at first, but it goes on, and that's known as organised stalking. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of it goes on where the perpetrators um, appear to uh, appear to be very subtle in their uh, in their covert stalking. Uh, it's a crime, and one of these days 
one of them's going to be detained. One of these days, it's going to happen where the whole lot's just going to blow. Uh, we had President Clinton talking about an apology to mind control victims. One of these days, it's going to blow on them. It yeah. is. Uh, I think it goes with the old Indian prophecy, isn't it? That I think what is covert, what is hidden becomes seen. You know, uh, and I think there's no getting away from that with this technology that they use. So I'm a, I'm actually a victim of, of mind control. Uh, I'm a man, I'm a Manchurian candidate, as it were, or somebody tried to let me into a Manchurian candidate, and that's where I get all my research from. And so it's, I've been chased by UFOs, followed by helicopters. Uh, so my research is my own life experience within all this. Okay. Um, we've also got another question in the chat room. Um, do you think that the local press and TV are trying to discredit UFO sightings? Um, no. When they, uh, when they make reports um, by putting on uh, that people are uh, that get uh, abducted after eating KFC or having children with aliens, for example. Yeah, that, that's, due to, that's due to a lack of understanding of editorial control by the people involved in that programme. Uh, you've really got to know your way around TV production. Do you know the programme I'm referring yeah, to? I know the programme you're referring to, and you've really got to know your way around. After I was defamed by the BBC and watched their management in action with me, and I don't miss a trick, and no. so I, I realised what they were doing. I'm going off piece slightly, what we're talking about. Yeah, no, uh, but believe it or not, oddly enough, I think that the worst form of censors are the alternative media. If it doesn't fit in within the camp of Alex Jones, and if it doesn't fit in within the camp of David Dyke, you censored. I was. I was censored by InfoWars. But yet I can walk on to ITV's This Morning program, and I can be sat with Holly Willoughby and Philip Schofield, and I get an easy ride from the other guy, uh, the Professor French. Very easy ride from him. And there's nobody around the corner waiting to shut me up. None of that happened. The same with Talk Sport. I used to go on Talk Sport regular before it became an old football station. Uh, and I said, what the hell I like. At one point in the proceedings, I was in the studio with Ian Collins. He just went to grab a coffee and left me talking to the callers. I could have said anything. Yeah. There was no censorship from the Channel 5 News as well. Just the same. No censorship. Say what I want. Uh, but the alternative media, that's a different story altogether. It's a bit disturbing. But... However, on saying that, uh, Channel 4, yes, they they defamed those individuals and put them up for ridicule, and it wasn't on. It just was not on, uh, really. Uh, that, that was, and I think that's why you've, when you're dealing with the media, you've got to know from the outset, you've got to set your stall out that you're not pissing about, basically, yeah. with what they want. you know. And, and I make that clear to any journalist now who comes my way, including the film crew that came to see me, who were told to F off back to London in no uncertain terms by me yeah. when they started thinking that they were going to go down this mainstream media BS uh, ridicule type thing. And uh, the, it, it got a bit heated with them, uh, with the presenter who was doing it. Got a bit heated because I was having none of this and he called me a narcissist, so I told him to F off back in his car to London and not bother uh, if that was the case. Because this is not a game. It's not some Boy no. Scout outing, you know? No. Um, it isn't, is it? Not really. We've got a few new people on the chat room. Um, they haven't come across Tony Topping before, okay? So, please bear with me. Um, but we are being asked, um, why do you think they are chasing you? You know, they have helicopters. Why do you think they're chasing you? Um, it wasn't, do, you it, do, they, yeah, do they censor you because you are closer to the truth? Yeah, th there's an element of that. I think uh, I think there's an element of the fact that uh, that something has uh, has gone on that I'm not aware of that they are aware of, and the more astute people who are watching this situation will say to me, not the fact that it didn't happen to me, but the f the, the more sinister connotation is well, how did they know before I did what was going on? Because they did. These people knew. Which, which is uh, which is very frightening for the democratic process because it means you've got something on mission creep that's absent without leave that knows all this information before anybody anybody else did. Uh, why do I think uh, they, they targeted me? Um, it's a highly complex question, but I think if we applied um, a bit of logic to this, uh, at one point in the proceedings they were doing a weapons testing on me with zero evidence weapons technology, so I was being experimented on. They were calibrating a weapon uh, on me, uh, a mind control weapon, while at the same time we had all the UFOs going on. Uh, that's what I think. Uh, and it could be, you know, but the door is open to all kinds of suggestions as to what has gone on with me, because at times it's been a curse. But it's an incredibly complex question, but that's one element of it. When it comes to UFOs and stuff like that, and life in general now, with with um, what, what you're experiencing and everything, do you find that um, the public are starting to learn too much, and that's what they're trying to rein us back in? 
Uh, no, I think no. There's a covert war going on. I think between what would be known as white and black interests. I, I, I think at the moment there, there is a, a covert war going on between the systems of democracy and the systems of banking uh, and big oil and, and all that kind of thing. Uh, and I think America is certainly getting hit in all directions. That country is getting hit at all levels. It's interesting with America at an esoteric level what's uh, what's going on. Uh, it's very interesting indeed because I think they're getting hit at all levels because this nation. America had done research on all this. They'd obviously had. They'd done the research on all this with their intelligence and military and had come to some conclusions, which I haven't been aware of, but I'd come to the same conclusions and then read back on it. Um, so I think that that country is getting hit in, in all directions at the moment because it seems to understand what's going on. Isn't it interesting that the, the place is in chaos? That country is in chaos. And I think there's a reason for it because it's, it's actually twigged what's, uh, what's going on as well as quite a few countries in the world have. Um, and I do also think as well that some elements of government somewhere is in contact with, uh, with UFOs and ETs. I think they are. Um, I do. Uh, I have a hazard, I hazard a guess possibly India or Russia is certainly speaking to them at some level, which brings me on to another fascinating story regarding Russia. If you want me to talk about that, but there you go. <laughs> well, do you, do you feel, um, uh, they, they obviously can't shut you up, Tony. Yeah, they can't hide what you know. No, they're they're, they're not. Um, <laughs> they're not winning. If you so, if you know what I mean. They're not winning. Uh, they're not winning with me. But some other posts so might might get it. But the the, the thing is, is they're they're not winning. Uh, they're not winning with me because I'm I'm just pushing on and yeah, piling on. Yeah, because like they're saying, yeah. if they don't want you to tell anyone these things, why have they not? You know. Put you no, they do. And, you know, some element, to... some element does want me to tell all this, which is why I'm, which is why uh, actually I do in general get a pretty easy time with the mainstream media when I go on these programs and talk about what I want to talk about. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've got a deg uh, It's quite fascinating that the alternative media seems to censor me, but the mainstream media, apart from the BBC, uh, who I'm very, very wary of, the damage has been really done with them. Uh, I'll never be involved with them again, because they are. A very strange and sinister outfit, I believe, uh, the way they carry on with things. Um, they, they really are. Um, but the, the, I'm still coming out with the stuff um, because I'm I'm in a position to do so. I'm probably in a more powerful position than what I think. Uh, perhaps when you've got a great big bloody triangle craft uh, that's coming over the bloody house just above the clouds and flies off again at speed, that's a clear signal to somebody somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not, you know, can I, I think. Can I just ask that, uh, is there an element of let him talk because it makes him sound like a nutcase? Uh, the, 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 <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, no disrespect yeah. to you, but, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, David Icke when yeah. he first came out with yeah. about Lee yeah. and all the rest of it, didn't they? Uh, is there a case of let him talk because he sounds like a nutcase? No, you uh, know, they did with David Icke, didn't they? They did, yeah. You know. uh, is there a case of let him talk because I, I will be shot at. Uh, when it really goes mainstream, all this, I will be absolutely shot to hell. And it will be interesting for your listeners and yourselves when, when, if it does happen, when I start getting shot at, what am I actually saying really? What will the, what will the media talk about me? But what am I saying really? Yeah. And the two will be out of sync because yeah. people will hear nutcase and then they come and look at my research and they go, my chuffing God. Precisely. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. You, so know, the, no, you know, Tony, we do respect you. We respect it. And, well, we, and we love your conversations. And, yeah, and we yeah. learn things on here. You exactly. Know, exactly. You know, so, Everybody, so please you know, don't take this as a disrespect. Oh, you know, Lovie, no, just, no, no, I don't. I don't <laughs> not, not, Lovie, not in the slightest, Lovie. You, you know, at the end of the day, you would, you would know about it if I was. Uh, or if you were on the wrong side of me, you would know about it, as this film crew did recently. Yeah. They really didn't know about it. But, we really you know, enjoy what you have to talk yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no. You, you, of course, no, these are very proper legitimate questions and yeah. I, i've got to say even the guy who was from this tv film uh, from this film crew he he was asking questions that that, that i thought was were fair enough actually once we calmed everything down mm. that's all that went on he was asking proper questions and, and the public deserve an explanation the public deserve to know and it is in the public interest to know that so that somewhere somebody in an agency uh, that, that has the national security apparatus covering it is running riot with mind control running riot with the bloody stuff. 
and it's it's just not on and it's against the democratic process that it's against all that we stood for on the beaches of d-day it's against everything that we have that we have stood for as a country that this is allowed to happen it's just absolutely yeah. disgusting what's going on and what has been going on with me is absolutely just disgusting that i'll get shot at yeah uh, you know i'll be the loon I'll be the tinfoil hat-wearing lunatic who had things beamed into his head. <laughs> Reiki Debs is asking, what's a zero-evidence weapon? A zero-evidence weapon, uh, zero-evidence weapons technology is part of uh, part of something called a New World Vista. Or, uh, it's part of part of pioneering research into non-lethal weapons. The, uh, there was a U.S. Air Force report uh, recently, not recently done, it was a few years back, uh, that indicated that this was the new form of weapons technology. Uh, it leaves no evidence and no trace. So, for example, uh, when somebody wakes me up at three in the morning and whispers into my head, we're going to kill you, um, I'm a loon. There's nice. no way. You, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. But, but actually, actually, it's been delivered via ultrasound. The systems can be delivered via satellite. They can be delivered via microwave. There has been a number of uh, there has been a number of concerning incidents within the ranks of the military oh. regarding off senior ranking officers who have uh, made remarks that this technology is completely out of control and they've been silenced. Um, there's been some shocking incidents, uh, including the former health minister of Finland. Uh, she has been targeted as well by these individuals. The question is, who are they? Who are they is the question, and they need to be detained, and they need to be, you know, and I'll take the witness stand, uh, because this, the, there's been horrific abuses with this technology. The American government are aware of it. The British government are aware of it. Um, it's been horrifying. Uh, I, I cannot describe to you, I just cannot describe the, the, at first it's laughable. You can't help it, can you? There's a smile no. on your face when you think quarter to six on the morning, they're waking up with an alarm clock. That's just hilarious. It'll loom. It, That's just it's so funny. It's got to be... Oh, I can't, but it isn't. I can't imagine your life, to no. be honest with you. you no, you be, can't. You're can't obviously you. plagued with this. Yeah. Uh, I have been. You know, uh, yeah. What, yeah uh, what is your... If you don't mind me asking, what is your typical day, Tony? Uh... Last it must week, be horrendous. It, last week, uh, two weeks ago, I think the attacks got so horrendous, I was disorientated for the week. I was being awoken at uh, three and four, five in the morning with strange goings on that disorientated me. Uh, lack of soft, soft sleep deprivation. Very soft sleep deprivation. Uh, and it disorientates. So that's especially true when I'm trying to work on something. I become disorientated for the week and don't know where I am. Mm. Uh, that can happen often. Uh, actually, um, uh, and it's because of some kind of bizarre goings on that I'm not quite sure that's happening, but it's happening all behind the scenes with very powerful interest, you know, very, very powerful interest. It's dangerous work. Um, so and I don't quite understand where it's all leading to, but it is, it is leading somewhere. So uh, last week, for example, I was just completely out of it for the whole week. Uh, I just didn't know whether I was coming or going. Um, and I just plodded on. Uh, Tony, uh Trying to understand why you. What did you actually do before this started? Uh, I, I had a well. I, I originally uh, I went to stage school. I trained as an actor and a dancer, uh, and then I uh, I left. All, I, I worked in London, and then I had a very very responsible job um, in the world of um, security. Uh, and it wasn't just kind of security guarding. It was quite involved. I think the saddest part of all of this story is the fact that it is they, they the people I talk about who made me leave my job. It is they who made me walk to work. I think the saddest part of all this, three days after my father died, I got hit. Uh, I got whacked with this technology about three days after he departed. Uh, and it was just too much for me. But they hit me again round about three in the morning when I was at my lowest step. And I, well, that was enough. To, it's enough to crack any man. And um, the thing is, is that you just cannot believe it's going on, can you? I can sense that you just cannot. It's beyond your comprehension. And that's fine. Uh, but there needs to be checks and balances with all this and it, it, it's the saddest part of the whole story I feel uh, that they would do what they would do and the thing is it's obviously the psychological profiling of these individuals behind all this they really must be real psychopaths real nasty yeah. things to work and what is also concerning is they're just above the law they think that they can do what the hell they're frigging like. Yeah. Whoever it is, wherever they, they, they just do what they want to do and they laugh at international law they're laughing at they've certainly breached EU law 
uh, these people because it's been banned under EU law. So they've, they've breached EU law and probably international law with their antics. And there are thousands of people out there who, at first glance, are oh, tinfoil hat wearing, we get the crazy. And then when you go into it, you get these horror stories. Mm. Uh, one woman anonymously emailed me. Well, she didn't, she didn't want a name given out. Uh, she's, uh, she did not want a name given out, but she told me an absolute horror story of what they were doing to her, but she didn't want to discuss it in public. Um, and this is the thing. There are quite a few people out there being targeted and uh, they don't want to discuss it in public you know it's very very worrying um, it is isn't it you know it's very worrying well as you know we love having you on the show and we love talking to you about the stuff that you research and yeah. um and we we don't um we don't judge you or anything like that or disbelieve anything you're telling us but the only reason why we ask you is so that when people come back and listen to the replay if they're new to us, they will then get an understanding of yourself. Yeah, right. I think so. so. I mean, I think for you guys tonight, I've come out with it. I've been a bit controversial even for me, I think, tonight. But I'm just absolutely angry at uh, what I what I am witnessing and what I am seeing as I an Englishman. I, 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 I do not um, expect you to be happy about it. I, I would be no. angry, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. But um, it's just... You know, there are conspiracies around all this as well, you know. It's yeah, just, of course. It's of just, course, yeah. The, the, the reality is we don't know who. No. Uh, I, have a, I, have, um, I have ideas, uh, very rough ideas as mm. to who it is that's behind it all. And I do believe that they are uh, loggerheads with each other over what they have done. And I believe it's, a, it's an organisation that's probably beyond the democratic process that's doing it, uh, that is above the law, can do what it likes. Something like the Bilderberger Group or something yeah. like that. Some secretive think tank. And... Uh, you know, this, this technology is barbaric, absolutely barbaric stuff, uh, and it's in public circulation. Now, the thing with this is that, of course, if we live in a democratic society, the question then must be, what does the democratic society do? Does it want this? Does it want justice to be served? Or will it just go with the flow because it's national security? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, we don't want this out in the public domain. What is the choice going to be? This is it. Well, Jamie's asking, why do you think the government are wanting to, us to stop knowing about the alleged UFO visits? Uh, I don't. I don't think the governments are. I don't think people at the level of David Cameron and mm. people at the level of uh, well, uh, people at the level of Barack Obama. I don't think are actually wanting to. Uh, I, I. I just don't think they are. I think that. Uh, I think that they're knowing a bit. I think the Russian president probably knows a bit more about the probably out of all the world leaders and the president of India probably knows a lot more about what is going on. But I think that this is more. Uh, this is more forces that are involved in um, navigating the democratic process of government if there could be such a thing now yeah. in terms of international banking in terms of chemical military complex these are the forces that that would indeed want this to be quiet uh, but also there are issues that arise in terms of the ethical behavior of the ufos that cannot be uh taken out of you know taken out of the equation the thing what irritates me about the ufo community is we've got this scenario of not in my backyard so there was a guy on my facebook page who, who was a head of a, a ufo organization a well-known one in america uh, and more or less was indicating to me well none of my team have been harassed and I haven't been harassed, so that obviously means you haven't been harassed. Mm. Well, I have been harassed, yeah. and a number of people have been harassed. Uh, and we've had a number of witnesses from, you know, Gordon Crichton from the uh, former British diplomat was indicating that it can get a bit hair-raising. I've had people coming up to conferences who worked in the civil service who said, yeah, it's uh, it's a bit, if we go, we go with this in public, we're going to get heat. Uh, you know, we, we don't like to talk about it. So that there is some disgusting uh, abuses going on with all this and it, it doesn't it's not very good at all not very good and the question is why yeah this is it yeah it's uh how do you say i mean going on what, on what sue said that i think uh there's two big things why people why they why would people would not want us to know first is the first thing powers that be think of is could it be used as a weapon and secondly, how much money can be made from it? Yes, that is true. We've, we've also got to add to the equation that some of these uh, off-world intelligences that may visit us in UFOs may have a complicity with other elements uh, within the human race to keep it quiet. Yeah. And then you would, then you do have indeed the ground rules for a covert, uh, covert war going on. You, you definitely would do then, based on the research I've read, if you've got something that's not quite uh, of our bloodline, of the human bloodline, and wanting to enforce silence, 
uh, that, you know, these wars, for example, that are going on are just World War One, World War Two are bizarre. They're just out of sync with everything, I think, unless I'm being naive. They just seem a bit odd, out of place, out of sync with, with, with things that are... It just seems we're being played. Uh, the human race is being played like a violin. And... Um, I think somebody somewhere's tweaked it. I know I have, and I think quite a few other researchers have as well. So, anyway, you've got this radio show that you've got on Planet X. Yes. And yes. Tuesdays, is it? It's Tuesdays, um, 8 p.m. Okay. Uh, on uh, planetxlive.co.uk. And what do you and, talk about on it? Uh, I talk about absolutely everything and anything, including current affairs. Okay. Uh, I recently interviewed George Galloway uh, regard, regarding Syria. Uh, we've interviewed David Shaler. Uh, we've interviewed. We, we like to interview, or I like to interview, interview people who are possibly in the in the public eye who have been controversial and I like to interview them uh, we did one to do with the sodium vulparate cover up uh, that was going on uh, where we had a, a, a lady on who had a child diagnosed with autism due to tablets she was taking and we expo well, exposed it. well yes I suppose we did in a way the show kind of like looked at, uh, looked at all that was going on with that so we look at everything, not just UFOs, but it is yeah. mainly UFOs, but we look at um, alternative current affairs, stuff that the media aren't reporting. We've got Breaking the Matrix goes out Sunday, 10 p.m., and that covers the alternative news, uh, the real nitty-gritty of things that aren't being told in the mainstream media. It takes a lot of work and effort to put it all together, but it's, it's well worth it. Uh, okay. This Tuesday, 8 p.m., we've got... Uh, Kathy, who's the UFO experiencer, and David Horridan of the U Birmingham UFO Research Group. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to be a belter of the show. And that's right. on at 8 p.m. next week, yeah. And what else have you got coming up in the in the next few months? Or yes, well, we've got we've got a book stall uh, coming up, and we're also going to attempt to write the book, uh, which everybody seems to be crying out for. They're absolutely saying, Tony, write a book, for God's sake, man, yeah. write a book. We need your book. So we're going to... Um, We've decided on a title for the book. It was going to be called Alien Darknet, but I, I think it's more going to be called The Paranormal Identity. Right. Uh, because that's that's what it's all about with me, trying to find my identity, trying to find out what yeah. the bloody hell has been going on, you know? And have you got uh, a conference coming up? Um, um, yes, we have. Yes, doing? we have got it. I've completely forgot about yeah, that. Yes, we have. Are you doing it with Nigel? Yeah, uh, yeah, we will we'll actually, yes, but that's next year. No, I'm actually right. at Truth Juice Liverpool oh, yeah. on the 11th of November. Uh, I'll be there from 7.30pm doing a remote viewing evening with them. Right. Uh, and what will you be doing? You'll be doing all the stuff to do with remote viewing and you'll get probably, if I think we're going to give you a free CD with a load of material on it, which is worth 30 quid. Uh, only a fiver on the door, that's Truth Juice Liverpool. Uh, and uh, we're going to do a remote viewing evening on the 11th at the Crosby Comrades Club in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. So and then, and as you say, there's one next year that you're doing with Nigel. Yes, that's that's the one next year. It's the UFO Awareness Conference, which is next year. Uh, that's in May of next year, and that's with that's with Nigel Morrison. Although I think details are to be are to be actually finalised on that one, but that's in May of next year. Uh, and uh, the TV stuff suddenly comes up with me, and then suddenly doesn't. So I could I could be called tomorrow to to go and appear on something. That's how it all works, oh. you know. And there again, at the last minute, they say, "Oh no, we've got something else going on," you know. So, but hopefully. We're gearing up to do more mainstream media uh, work in this field. Uh, it's certainly what I uh, what I would like to do. So that's where we're heading for with it, publishing and the media definitely with all this. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Tony. It's been great having you back on. No all problem. Right, and stay safe out there. I will. Yes, and all thank right. you for your continued support and the support of your listeners. TonyTopping.co.uk is my website. Loads of fascinating stuff on it. Yes, it definitely is. Well, thank you very much, my love. You take care, and thanks All for right. coming back on the show. No problems. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Don't be a stranger. <laughs> well, that was Tony Topping, and Miss Skype's just gone away well, so I'm hopefully he's, uh, he's disconnected. Let me just... Uh, Wait for it not responding. That was Tony Topping, and um, uh, yeah, so controversial. bit controversial, conspiracy theories sort of thing. You know, I'm just waiting for this to uh, shut down a bit because um, it's just gone and not responded. <coughs> Hopefully, it'll work all right. I might have to refresh it for for when I do when uh, boss's name comes on. The um, no, 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 that's not the address. I'll find the address for you. Um, so, yes, it, it is um, quite interesting. 
Um, if Tony, if you can hear me, I hope you've disconnected. But uh, I'll have to close this program and restart it, I think. Um, let me just find it for you, Steve, and then I can give That's it to right. you. Oh. All right. Just making sure that wasn't it before I sealed it in. No, that wasn't <laughs> it. <laughs> right, so basically, that's Tony Topping. Tony Topping is, he is, does sound very controversial. Um, he does sound to the, um, what's the bed, the, those that don't know him. Yeah. He does come across a little bit. Strange, I suppose, would be the best way. But if you have a look at his website, the amount of stuff that's on there, he's got, um, let's just sign back in here already. He's got things like uh, new psychic espionage seminars and workshops from Doe and Tobin, spies like lies wannabes and uk uh, ufo freaks the weird world of tony Tobin, um russian and british spy uh, psychic spies does a lot about remote viewing and stuff like that there's quite a few things there um that you might want to have a look at and you know but uh, it's something and what we've got to, what you've got to realize is as we always tell people it is our intention to provide our listeners with different views and outlooks promoting discussions or we, or we assume um, no responsibility of the opinions and beliefs are p are pr expressed by our guests, callers, listeners and chatters on the KTPF Community Talk Show. The opinions expressed are solely the options of the original source who expressed them. We also take no responsibility of the opinions of others in the postings and comments in chat rooms and or on the forum post. Uh, we don't expect... <laughs> That's coming back. We don't ex <laughs> don't accept any comments that are obscene in sexual nature, racist, profession, personally offensive, and otherwise inappropriate. Will be accepted. And if if you post such comments, we will remove them. But you must remember that um, uh, you know in this time of misinformation, the government-controlled media is required by law to inform you that these shows are for entertainment purposes only. But uh, that's another matter. But yes, it's um, it it is something that we need to uh, think about. Maybe you never know. It can. But can I just say in in Andy's uh, defence of yes. what was on the chat room? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was feeling generally because of concerned the, concerned because because of his uh, oh. of what he used to do of his profession his profession. Yeah. Uh, it, I can understand uh, that. He was seeing all the markers that he was that he yes. to look out for. Yeah. And so he was showing genuine concern for Tony. Uh, the, un the unfortunate thing is uh, when these things are, are actually happening, they're the same uh, same things that people look out for. But have you noticed when people, and you must admit, yeah, right, you must admit, chatters, yeah, in the chat room, that when we talk about these sort of things to people, there's been certain genres that we talk about and they all seem to have the same um, theories, uh, expressions, beliefs. You know what I mean? They're really into this. Yeah. You know, um, we know somebody who used to be on the chat room that are really believing such stuff and they, they, that's the way they are. You know, it's like a ghost. People believe in ghosts. People, people turn around and say, "Don't be daft." You know, mm. it's what people believe. And and like Jamie said, you know, um, it is their belief. But there is, it does look as though that some of these people have got a chemical imbalance. You know, well, if I, you're well, unsure. I, when I when I first heard uh, what came out of from David Icke. Admittedly, I haven't read his book, so I haven't heard him talk or, or actually spoke to the guy. But from what came out in the press, and we all know the press can be manipulated, Yeah, he sounded like a complete nutcase. I know. And I'm thinking, how the hell did he get from being a centre yeah. to that? Um, I, 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 and also, also there, that on, on David Icke, he makes... Thousands selling these books and people coming to his lectures. Yeah. So he's not the only one that believes in this. No, stuff. this is it. You, that's what you got to think about. These people do have followers, and you know, and and that. So there are people out there that believe in it, and we've got to 
basically respect that in that way, haven't we? We do, we do. Okay. I mean, I, I mean when, I, when I said that about being knocked right. out, I, I wasn't actually calling him one. No, 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 no. No, we like Tony. You know, whatever he's going through, you know, we feel for him, don't we, really? We do. We you know, and we uh, hope and we hope uh, that he stays safe out if, there. If, 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 everything, if everything he says is actually happening, I really wouldn't want it to be happening to me. Yeah, well, this is it. So, um, right. Well, what we'll do is we'll um, uh, Kieran's online, ready. So, what we'll do is we'll do the. Uh, <coughs> don't mention Chelsea. <laughs> what we'll do is we'll do the adverts, and um, and then we'll be with you in a bit. The Paranormal Intelligence Gathering Services Ghost Store is a one-stop shop for all of your ghost hunting gadgetry needs. Run by ghost hunters for ghost hunters, the shop is filled with all of the latest in investigation equipment shipped in from all around the world, from high-quality digital dictaphones to EMF pumps, infrared illuminators to laser grid pens, CCTV equipment to data loggers. All of our equipment has already been imported, so you can buy it safe in the knowledge that there will be no hidden costs. And with our postage promise, you'll never pay more than the actual postage price. So visit www.the-pigs.co.uk forward slash ghost store. Yeah, that was the advert for pigs. And uh, if you feel like getting anything from there, you can go and have a look and see what they've got. So, uh... We've got all the news right here. Don't go away. See you in a moment. Fed up of wading through the activities and events that other advertisers include? Find just what you're looking for at ParanormalEventsForYou.com Your one-stop paranormal directory. And on the 31st of October, spectacular events at the Herefordshire Hall with Most Haunted's Brian Shepherd. On the weekend of the 2nd of November, there's an MBS at the new Epic Centre Lincolnshire Showground, Grange Dillings. On the 30th of November, UK Shadow Seekers are off to Morecambe Winter Gardens, Morecambe. And on the 14th of December, UK Shadow Seekers are going to Sheffield Town Hall, Sheffield. And don't forget, the all new Bluebell Hill Ghost Walks in Chatham are on until the 31st of December. So check out the One Stop Paranormal Directory for more investigations and events available now. ParanormalEventsForYou.com also offers Banner advertising for only £10 per year. See our website for more details. ParanormalEventsForYou.com Your one-stop paranormal directory. Yeah, that's the events coming up in the next few weeks. And uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to call the man and hope you're ready. <coughs> Hello. Hello. Hi, good evening. Hello, how are you? Not too bad. Um, how are you? I'm all right, thank you very much. Good, good. Ladies and gentlemen in the chat room, I would like to introduce you to um, a very distinguished gentleman. Um, we've been trying to get him on the show for ages, and he's finally here, and it's Dr. Kieran O'Keefe, parapsychologist. Presenter, researcher, writer, investigative psychologist. Now, can I call you Kieran? Yeah, of course. Right. Well, my, name, my name's Suzanne, and my husband Steve's here with me as well. Brilliant. And um, uh, we'd just like to thank you again for coming on the show, for taking time out for us. Absolutely. And, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. And I managed to uh, log on, I guess, a, a few minutes before, and so heard the tail end of what sounded like a fascinating first guest. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And uh, obviously we get a lot of people with different beliefs and stuff like that. And um, from the last guest, there was uh, quite a few uh, bits of concern in the chat room that maybe 
you know, not knowing the gentleman, he, he might have been a little bit deluded, unfortunately. But uh, that's just the way people are with their beliefs. And I'm sure you've got your own beliefs as well, So, um, which we're going to find out about. But before we go any further, Kieran, can you tell me about yourself, the man, for getting most haunted and, and okay. everything? Uh, can you just tell us about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, well, the other side of me is that I'm uh, a lecturer, senior lecturer at a university uh, where I specialize in criminological psychology and also various aspects of forensic psychology. Um, so that's my other hat. That's my uh, crime hat, as it were. I do a lot of work looking at restorative justice and, and ways of uh, kind of reducing offending. Yeah. It's my, the other side of my research. And then in terms of parapsychology stuff, um, I also do a lot of research in university, uh, doing testing, that sort of thing, but also write quite a bit in terms of parapsychology. And that's, I guess, the main thing about me is that I'm an applied psychologist who specializes in crime, but also in the paranormal. Right, okay. And I need you to clear something up for us, if you sure. won't mind. Um, we know you as Dr. Kieran O'Keefe, and, yeah. and it was assumed that you are a doctor in parapsychologist uh, for the show and everything. But um, it then came about that it was to do with music. So could you clarify this for me? Yes, I can clarify that quite easily. Uh, my first degree was, uh, a, well, a joint degree um, in music and psychology, so two separate job subjects, mm -hmm. which I graduated in, my undergraduate degree. My master's degree was in investigative psychology, which is uh, psychological assistance for criminal investigations, and I specialized in psychic detectives and psychic detection towards the end of that master's. My PhD is actually a parapsychology PhD. It's a, oh, PhD. Yeah. It's a PhD in terms of psychology, because it's part of a psychology department, but it's a parapsychology uh, topic, looking at mediums and various other uh, paranormal claimants. I think people might have got confused because all the way through my career from, well, since the 18, but actually since the age of four, I've been a musician. Right. So I've been playing music as well, and I've done a lot of work um, looking at the um, emotional reaction to music, emotional response to music, looking at infrasound, low frequency sound, but in a concert setting. So I did some work at the Royal Festival Hall, and because of that, then got involved in looking at infrasound in haunted locations. So I think there might be some confusion there because yeah. of having many different hats, as it were. You're right. Well, before we start with the question, we're can all, I just... Already getting questions. We're already getting questions in the oh, chat brilliant. room, but uh, we would like to know, um, to start us off, how did you get the most haunted role? What happened there? <laughs> I was employed up at Liverpool Hope University. Mm -hmm. They had quite an active parapsychology unit at the time. Uh, myself, Matthew Smith, a couple of other parapsychologists, uh, Christine Simmons, Carl Williams... And at the time, Matthew Smith was on Most Haunted. Yes, we remember uh, him. We remember him from the live shows and also commenting on the episodes at the end. And uh, he said to me that there may be occasionally ones that he couldn't do. And so I subbed in for him occasionally, kind of as his, as his stunt double. Yeah. Of some of the episodes. And uh, I think I did a couple of lives as well for him. There was King's Cross Live, one of the ones I did. Yeah. She was meant to do. And over the course of, of that period, which I guess was about a year, Carl and Yvette were asking both of us, Matthew and myself, to come and join the team on investigations. And uh, Matthew went initially because the most haunted thing was his gig anyway. So he joined the team. He did an investigation in Liverpool. I think it was, uh, was it Cropsteth Hall? Right. Uh, he did an investigation there. and. He enjoyed it, but at the same time said it wasn't really for him in terms of joining the team. My area of specialty as a parapsychologist has always been haunting experiences, and I always enjoy field research anyway. So I am Denard for about six months, and then um, I took them up on their offer, 
but I didn't initially join the team. The first ever episode I did was at the Black Swan in Devizes in Wiltshire, yeah. where Yuri Geller was a guest. Mm-hmm. Um, and I went along because I obviously knew about Yuri Geller, but uh, never met him. So I went along, joined the team there, wasn't officially part of the team, uh, enjoyed myself, then did a couple of investigations in Ireland, Castle Leslie, uh, and then came back and did a live show at Derby, Derby Live, and really got to know Richard Felix a lot more as a result of that. And it was at the Derby Live that they asked if I wanted to join the team full time, which I did. All right. Steve, you got a question? Uh, I'm going to do the one for Andy first. Okay. Uh, Andy's asking, do you still stand by the findings in your in your thesis, i.e. Uh, none of it mediumship uh, actually stands up? Ah, that's an interesting question because you've, you've kind of asked two different things there, Andy. One is, do I stand by what I originally said in my thesis, which was that, that um, you know, mediums don't really stand up? Um, in terms of what I found, mm. it's it's maybe a slight, although you're kind of along those lines, it's a slight misinterpretation of my conclusions from the PhD. One thing that, even though obviously I'm a skeptic, it doesn't mean that I'm a cynic. So it means that I'm open-minded and I'm constantly questioning, um, but I'm also looking for the evidence. And one aim of the PhD, aside from looking at language of mediums and psychics and and various claimants. The other thing I was doing was setting up a test that instead of all the previous tests that had been done by skeptics and parapsychologists, where they had designed the tests so controlled and so experimentally that the mediums and psychics were, were basically, they were set up to fail as far as I was concerned. Mm-hmm. The way I did things was I wanted to set up a test that was a good test that would stand up to any sort of criticism from other parapsychologists, but at the same time, I didn't want to be the one, the sole person setting up the test. And so what I did was all of the people that were involved, all of the mediums, the psychics, I looked at astrologers too, handwriting analysts who claim some sort of intuitive ability. They were all involved from the very start in terms of helping to set up the experiments so that they would be 100% happy with, with the experiments being run. Because... Yeah, at the end of the day, I didn't want a medium coming into the lab and conducting their mediumship and then not being happy about the environment or being uncomfortable about the environment. It even got to the point where I was asking them uh, what sort of chairs they would like to sit on, what yeah. sort of tea, what biscuits, what would the lighting be like for them to be 100% comfortable. In an ideal world, I'd like to have done the tests in their homes. Mm were in their natural environment, but that wasn't going to work. And so to answer Andy's question, the conclusions, if you look at the summary uh, and conclusion of my PhD, it's basically saying that I was looking for a test that was directed by the claimant, directed by the paranormal claimant, essentially directed by their ability and also in negotiation with them. The mediums and psychics I tested as part of the PhD weren't accurate and they didn't show any evidence of uh, paranormal ability in those tests. However, if you look at some articles that I published from the PhD, it does make the huge caveat, which is I'm only referring to those mediums and psychics that I tested. Uh, It would be arrogant of me to say there is no such thing as mediumship and there is no such thing as psychic ability on the basis of me testing, what, six mediums and on the basis of me testing a handful of psychics. I think that would just be, that re- really would be arrogant of me to say that. So I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm saying those ones that I tested, no ability in the tests that I ran. But there has been, in for me, a slight change in my perspective, which is the other part of Andy's question. You know, has anything changed since you've done your PhD? Mm-hmm. And I think the big change for me is is even as I was writing up the PhD, realizing that, you know what, mediumship can never be tested in the lab. In the lab. I don't think it genuinely can mm-hmm. now, because even if you had the best possible setup, uh, the best possible experimental room, if the medium was 100% happy, and if they came up with 100% accurate information, 
all you could show with any guarantee was that they were communicating with a client or sitter, whoever you want to call it, they were communicating with them using some sort of paranormal communication. Now, that would be amazing, mm. but that's all you're showing. You wouldn't be showing that they were necessarily communicating with spirit because if they got the, the information that was accurate, is it mediumship? Are they communicating telepathically with the, with the sitter that's in, in another room? Are they tapping into some sort of Akashic records and picking up the information there? Who's to say where they're actually getting that information from? You can't prove that. No. You can only go by what the medium's actually saying in terms of whether they're saying that they got it from spirit. And so that's what I mean is that you could bring hundreds of mediums into the lab, but from a scientist's point of view, you can't prove that they're communicating with spirit. You could prove that they're communicating paranormally, but how they're actually doing that, I don't think you could ever prove that in a lab. Right. We have Reiki Deb. She's asking a question. Now, obviously, you've been on quite a few um, investigations um, I assume on and off from uh, Most Haunted. You've done um, Jane Goodman Investigates, quite a few shows, haven't really, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, um, Jane, yeah Jane Goldman did uh, the first two series with Jane Goldman. Great show. Okay. Well, Reiki Debs is asking um, about your thoughts and opinions on table tipping. Does Do you think it's paranormal or manipulation? Uh, I don't think it's paranormal. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what's happening, um, when you say manipulation, I think uh, w what she's getting at is that people are actually tipping the tables yeah, themselves. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the most likely explanation. Um, for me, I'd like to see the table being tipped. I can understand why people might want to touch it initially. It might be an energy thing. But after that point, maybe when the energy has been built up, if then people remove their hands from the table and it continues to move, then I'll be impressed. Yeah. Saying yeah. that, uh -huh. and, and, and I'm, going, I'm going off my experience being part of investigations and not just Most Haunted, but private investigations too, also going off my experience in terms of footage that people have provided me with, you know, table phenomena which is levitation, table turning, table tipping. I'm going off all of that and saying I'm not overly impressed. However, there are a couple of interesting cases. Um, the Philip experiment, for example, in, in Canada, I think it was, where a group of people got together and they, they made up uh, a ghost that they tried to communicate with because their theory was that it's not actually a ghost or spirit that's moving the table. It's the collective almost PK. Yeah. It's the, it's the collective will of the people around the table that are making it move paranormally rather than any sort of physical pushing. Um, and I think what they found is very, very interesting. I mean, they did it, an experiment over the course of months and months and months and months with the same group sitting around a table and, and coming up with uh, stories about this particular fake ghost in order to try and get the energy up and get the table moving. And they report some very interesting findings and report that the table moved and that it was down to some sort of group PK. So if I were to see that sort of evidence live, um, I could understand the logic of that. I could understand why that's happening and I'd be impressed. But for the time being, everything I've seen over the last 25 years, um, I'm not convinced one bit by table tipping. Okay. Uh, that story you was t you were saying about there is that is that the one where the uh, the supposed ghost actually started to talk to people? Uh, yes, they 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 well the groups the group reported as though they were getting communications. Yes, even though it was a ghost that they had made up, uh, they came up with the entire backstory to this ghost to try and uh, create. The phenomena and initially started there was a designated person sitting at the table who would uh, fake the phenomena who would push the table and then at a pre uh, predefined date all that fake phenomena would stop and they would just continue with the uh, with the table phenomena. and yeah they did report communication they reported sense of presence as well sometimes people even reported feeling as though they were being touched 
the sort of phenomena that you would expect in a seance room, basically. Fascinating case. Yeah. Uh, Jamie in the chat room, he, he said that he, uh, he sent you a photograph, uh, which I've seen from uh, 1899, after he met you at Elskar. Uh, it was a child sitting down at what looks like monks behind him. Uh, do you remember the Im image? Because he said it still fascinates him. All oh, right. You must, you must get uh, hundreds I'm of pictures. Remember, I'm trying to remember which image it is. <laughs> if he sends it to me again, just because obviously I get... Right. Well, yeah, you must get quite a few. Hundreds yeah. 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 The, uh, I'd love to see that again. 1899 and their monks sitting behind. Okay. Behind but, the child. Yeah, uh, I've zoomed in and it's... They are faint, but if you, if you zoom into the picture... You can right. actually see uh, the, the bit about it that fascinates with me is that at that time we're talking about plates, aren't we? Talking about photographic yes. plates at that yeah. time. Yes. yes, and although there was lots of, you know, there's this uh, spirit photography as well that occurred, although maybe a little bit later than that, you know, so there was fakery going on. Mm. I'm, I'm a little bit more impressed at those, those pre 1900 photographs that come out and do have weird footage on them. Right, okay. So we there do you go, Jamie. Send it to him again and he'll yeah. have a look. Please. We um, we do uh, have more questions um, for you. Um, one of the questions which I've just lost, um, <laughs> the chat room goes up and down, <laughs> I must admit. Um, there was a question um, somewhere here, uh, which I'll find in a moment. But oh, of all the events that have been on on Most Haunted and other things, have you ever investigated a location where absolutely nothing happened or any, of any, you know, nothing paranormal happened at all? Um, if, <laughs> have I ever been on a Most Haunted investigation where nothing happened? No. No? Yeah. no? <laughs> yeah. I mean, only no, because it is. That's that, one that, that must be terrible if you go on one like that and yet you've got to put a program out. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Has there only been any? Well, there have been there have been um, uh, places that we visited where there've been very little activity. Yeah. Uh, where it's just been you know the odd sense of being touched and maybe the odd voice and uh, just a couple of things versus versus a lot of what you yeah. get on the majority of the episodes. But no, I, I don't know if we've been anywhere where absolutely nothing has happened. Certainly, there have been people having experiences in most locations, and that's most haunted. But in private investigations, so in investigations beyond and outside of most haunted, I think probably my experience reflects the experiences that most ghost hunters out there listening have, which is the majority of places that I have visited, mm. nothing has happened. Or at least you can visit a location a number of times and 90% of those of those visits, nothing happens. And then maybe on one of the visits, something happens. And that's generally my experience. Yeah. Um, if you could provide one piece of, of advice for others um, interested in investigating a paranormal phenomena, what would it be? I would say keep your wits about you. Right. I think people, people generally ask me for advice about gadgets um, and kind of the sceptical side, but I think the best advice is, is just, yeah, it's just keeping your wits, wits about you, just being aware that it could be any sense that can pick up on something being there. It's not just people think they have to see something or they have to see something on camera. It's a sense of presence, touch. You might just get a sense, an emotional sense that there's something there. But also keeping your wits about you also means being aware of all of those rational explanations for what's going on. Because I'm more impressed with people that come to me with evidence or accounts of their own experiences, but they're aware of sceptical explanations and they've thought very carefully about it. And I think that would be the main thing. And a notepad and pencil and a camera. Right. So uh, when it comes to gadgets like K2s and, and EMF meters, you don't think, do you not think that they're any, really any good? Uh, I don't think K2s are any good. No. Um, I think they are, you know, brilliant if you want to set up a little disco um, when you're visiting a haunted <laughs> location. Uh, but in terms, of, in terms of what they're trying to achieve, no. A lot of people use them as ghost detectors and there's no proof anywhere that uh, ghosts give off any sort of field 
that we can pick up using any sort of gadget. Mm. If anything, the, the development of the K2 and other EMF meters has come from uh, research that's been conducted again in Canada, a guy called Persinger, that shows there's particular levels and fluctuations of uh, geo um, EMF, so geomagnetic uh, fields. And it's certainly the level of fields that you wouldn't find or be able to detect uh, with any of your handheld devices. Um, so you can't, you wouldn't be able to use that. However, there are a couple of EMF meters out there which are, which are quite good, but they're a little bit more expensive. One is called the Isotec. If you look that up, um, Isotec, I think it's 294. Right. And that particular uh, gadget kind of operates in the same sort of level or a useful level in terms of discounting possible natural explanations. And so when you're using an EMF meter, the best advice I can give is if somebody has an experience in a haunted location and you don't pick up anything strange on the EMF meter in terms of uh, spikes mm -hmm. or weird readings, then you know that potentially that person has had a genuine experience because you didn't pick up anything strange on that meter. If you picked up something strange, a spike or weird readings, then what you've actually found is a source of EMF that could potentially affect the person's brain, which would make them hallucinate. Yeah. And yeah. so if you don't get the reading, then that's a better judge of whether there's a genuine experience. But my favorite gadgets by far is anything to do with temperature. I think, and colleagues have, have discussed this with me, and um, psychical researchers are always pushing this forward, that temperature is some of the best evidence that has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years for the presence of a ghost. We use, um, uh, we, me and Steve are uh, part of UK Shadow Seekers, we're co-founders. Well, you, may, you may have heard of us, you may not have done. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're just a little not-for-profit group. Um, but uh, we've used the um, the trigger gun um, temperature thermometers, yeah, oh, yes. um, and we've put it in one place, and we've asked the the, um, the spirit, possible spirit, to drop the temperature at a certain amount of degrees. And when it hasn't done it all the time, but when it has done it a couple of times um, since we've been going which is about seven years <laughs> um we then ask them to take it back up again and we've right. had some results on that and yeah. um it's, you know what uh, what do you think to in, that? in some is cases that, we've had a, a a 10 degree movement yeah a 10 degree movement when when we haven't moved the actual you know from that particular spot and when you say when you say um trigger gun um Temperature device. Is it a, it's a laser? It a, laser a laser? Yeah, the laser thermometer. Right. So it's it's pointed at a surface. Then mm -hmm. is it? Or where is it pointed? It could be pointed to the floor yeah, or to the wall we the or wherever we are in the room. Right. Okay. Because that makes it a little bit more interesting. The fact that it's a laser gun. If it was atmospheric, so it's picking up on air temperature, I say that you guys might be affecting it because because of willing it to increase by two degrees, you can almost, or we can all, affect our temperature. Uh, even ever, even ever 10 so degrees, Kieran, 10. It's not, okay, 10, 10 degrees. degrees. <laughs> That's a very big jump. But if, yeah. it's pointed, if it's pointed at a wall, you wouldn't expect, and there's no way, actually, that a wall would change in 10 degrees, uh, make a 10 degree jump in a very short period of time. Yeah, we're talking a matter of minutes. We're not, to, you know, no more than yeah. five, ten you know, five, ten minutes sort of thing. Yeah. Well, then, I, you know, I don't have an explanation for that. Simple as that. The only thing that I'd be a bit wary of, and I guess that's what you're you're yeah. saying you're doing now, is keeping a, almost keeping a log, whether it's even with yeah. campus or whatever, a log of when it does happen versus when it doesn't happen, because it becomes more impressive when it happens more than when it doesn't. Right. Uh, unfortunately, uh, only it happens a lot with minor jumps, but we don't put much so much on that. But the uh, the larger jumps is, is is quite rare, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And and um, would you agree that uh, there are there are groups out there that just go out and do the ghost hunt that particular night, you know, and they they tell us what they've done, you know, they they do do a report. Do you think um, 
or do you agree with with us that it is better to start logging things, EMFs and stuff like that? Do you think um, it's 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 good to actually log things so that you can go back to them, or or would you say, you know, as some groups do, they just do the event and then that's it? Well, it depends on the motivation for doing the investigation. Like you say, some groups yeah. uh, will just go for one night and the motivation may be just because they have one night free as a group and so they choose a location and yeah. it's booked in advance and they just want that one night's ghost hunt. That's fine. Mm. I don't have a problem with that. Oh, no, I also no. don't have a problem with um, companies doing events. You know, a lot of colleagues do, but I don't. You know, it's it's all down to motivation. Yes. That is the group, like you say, like yourself, who will visit a location um, repeatedly uh, and repeatedly log uh, environmental data, temperature, EMF, you name it, to try and get a sense of what's going on in a particular location, mm. to record with photographs, with cameras, and to build up a, a general picture. That, again, is an, another style of investigating which which I am in favour of. Do, would you say that's the better better way really of doing it if anyone really wants to get the um uh get the results they want of finding out whether there is um spirits out there life oh, after yeah. death yeah I agree with you in, yeah in in my opinion it's the better way yeah. but it's also quite key what you're saying that it's you're saying you know is it the better way if people want to go in there and get results well yes I think it is the better way yeah. but then there are also groups that will be very happy going into a location for one night and they'll come out of, out of it with some amazing results and they'll be happy. Right, well, well um, obviously um, when it comes to investigations, um, the, um, the, the, the public want to know, or Deb, Debs wants to know, what was your best paranormal experience if you've ever had one? <laughs> um, I would say I've had over the course of coming on to 15... 1600 investigations now um which includes about 250 300 most haunted ones and the rest mm -hmm. private with various other teams i would say over the course of those investigations i may have had 100 150 experiences that other people might class as paranormal but because of my knowledge and kind of skeptical perspective I know that there's a skeptical explanation. I know that there's an alternative explanation for those experiences. However, there's a couple of places uh, where I still scratch my head about. One of them is um, in a bat, well, clo now it's closed down nightclub in Birkenhead. Mm -hmm. The other one is a bunker uh, on the Channel Islands. And those two locations are kind of scratch head moments for me the the um, abandoned nightclub in Birkenhead or closed down nightclub in Birkenhead where a fire exit doors opened of their own accord and picked up some very very strange footage on a thermal imager and then uh, the bunker in the Channel Islands just a very odd place with a very very strange atmosphere um, uh, a lot of people that have been in there are uh, have been very spooked by it um, been some odd photographs that have been captured there just a, a very very strange place and at some point when I was investigating I heard footsteps from outside a particular room L like the story goes went to investigate and there was nobody there uh, and I know that because the only people that were investigating were in that room with me um, and yeah it's little it, I, it's little experiences like that and there's only a couple out of the hundreds and hundreds that I've done uh, that will keep me investigating and keep me involved in this field. Mm. When you, you, you're you portrayed as a sceptic, and I think yeah. you still look at yourself as one of them, really. Yeah. Um, but when you get things like that, how can you be sceptic? Or is it a healthy scepticism? Oh, yeah, it's healthy scepticism. Mm. I think too often... People confuse skepticism with cynicism. Yeah. And cyn being cynical is the same as the other side as being dogmatic. C cynic means that you are closed-minded, uh, that you won't listen to any other opinion, you won't listen to what anybody else has to say, uh, you won't even actually investigate uh, 
for your own purposes. So I meet lots of cynics um, involved in not so much parapsychology, but involved in science, mm. who are cynical of the paranormal and yet have never stepped into a haunted location, have never visited a psychic, never visited a medium, and yet they're cynical of it. And I always say, well, okay, don't be so cynical of it unless you've actually gone into these particular locations and at least tried it. But also, don't be cynical about it if you haven't read all of the amazing cases that have been written about in the last 150 years. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm coming from, is that you're right, healthy skeptic, somebody who is always questioning, always wants to look at the evidence and let the evidence speak and convince me. Uh, but at the same time, I'm open-minded to the possibility of all of this stuff. Right, there's a couple of questions I just want to ask you about a location I went on myself yeah. uh, with our group. Um, we went to the Golden Fleece uh, right. in York, and uh, I don't know, I excuse my ignorance, but I can't remember if you was actually on the program or not, but um, there was a section where uh, Stuart was in... Um, the toilet, wasn't he, yeah, in the ensuite? Yeah, yeah, it was the one with Scott Mills on it. Yeah, Scott Mills was on that one, yeah. Oh, uh, that was uh, in York. Yes. Now, we went there, and um, this was back in 2006, and uh, we were in the um, first room um, uh, with the ensuite, and we'd been calling out, and just at the end of the vigil, we placed somebody in the toilet, and they didn't want us to shut the door. And uh, beforehand, before we started the vigil, was, uh, my husband had gone round and tightened up all the um, taps because Stuart said the taps were running. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and now. And dried the sink. And he dried the sink as well. Yeah. We so thought we'd see what happened. Um, on his own omission, he, he did say that he could have possibly tightened them. Too too much, you yeah. know. Yeah. But uh, we're talking. Uh, it did take three hours for it yeah. To trip. We're talking about three hours later, and the, the the young lady was in the toilet. We were calling out, um, and we didn't know we'd caught anything. And then all of a sudden, she said, "The taps are dripping. I can hear the taps dripping." Yeah. And when we checked, yes, they were dripping. Three hours later. Right. When I checked my dictaphone. Um, I recorded a little girl's voice. We're saying, can you do something for us? And it sounds like the little child is saying, now I, I will show you. It's on our website. Yeah. And it was just before the girl turned around and said, the taps are dripping. Now, oh, so, so the voice, the implication is the voice is saying that she'll show you it and the and taps dripping is her showing you which is what we assume yeah now right. we haven't really had that um analyzed but it does sound like a child yeah right um mm. before we started the vigil we was downstairs having something to eat mm. and uh we took a picture i was taking a picture of the bar area and we've got um a shadow behind the bar which just happens to be um, below the alleged hook that's in the fourth ceiling from where a previous landlord was supposed to have hung himself. Right. We had somebody put a heat thing round it, you know, um, heat blast it or something, and they were saying that um, if it was... Right. Well, it's can a, you explain, Steve? I can't remember what the program was, but it, you basically used, used the program and it shows uh, where the heat sources should be on the picture. Okay. Uh, it did show the room, the door at the behind it, just where the kitchen was. There was there was a lot of heat coming from the gaps around that, and other areas. But the uh, the shadow itself, there was absolutely nothing. It was solid. There was nothing coming from it at all. Right. And it's always been intriguing to us. <laughs> but uh, what would if you was to see something like that or hear uh, a voice? Like that on a dictaphone. What would you have? You ever had any EVPs that you can see? Yes, yeah, I've, I've had not not a huge number, but I'd say in the region of maybe fifteen, twenty. But there are a few, certainly this year, that have been quite exciting, um, and I think they're really exciting things mm. to try and interpret and to try and make sense 
of of why you're getting that message, which yeah. is ultimately what you did in terms of you, you got the girls. It sounded like a girl's voice, and she was instructing or so or giving warning mm. what was going to happen. And I must say, when it comes to EVPs, um, I, again, I'm keeping very much an open mind because EVPs have been around now for over 50, 60 years yeah. in terms of an evidence, a type of evidence from these investigations. And a lot of the most convincing evidence from haunting investigations, I think, comes from EVPs. Um, it needs to be a bit more controlled, so yeah. there needs to be, you know, cameras ensuring that there's nobody around whilst these EVPs are captured. But you know, if, if you get something like that where a voice coincides with some apparent phenomena, it maybe makes it a bit more interesting. Mm. In terms of the shadow phenomena, yeah, uh, you're essentially saying, Steve, that the shadow, according to the program, the shadow is essentially showing. Uh, that it was the same temperature as the surroundings, or it was showing it was showing that it was a solid mass. It, is that what you're saying? It was yeah. A, yeah. So a shadow is a solid mass. Well, that that ties into um, my going back to where was I? A Waverly Hills Sanatorium mm -hmm. uh, in America, an amazing location, and. Uh, although, we invest although we investigated there with Most Haunted, I talked to the owners at length about the various types of, uh, they call them shadow people, um, the various types that they've witnessed, or more so people who have visited the location, witnessed, and some have captured on, on camera and captured on thermal images too. And one type of shadow people is the solids. And it sounds like the phenomena that you captured in that terms of that particular photograph wow. matches that. That is that sort of solid shadow, which which seems it just seems very odd and very creepy. Yeah, too. We, we, the, they did try and say that there was probably a barmaid behind there, but there was another barmaid coming into view because I took it took the picture. I was hoping not to catch anyone in there, you know, because I wanted a picture of the actual. Um, uh, the way the actual bar was set up, you know, and I didn't want any barmaid in view. And cool. somebody comes in just to the left, who's a small girl with glasses. But um, you know, but even if there was somebody else standing beside, uh, behind there, I should have caught some sort of um, appearance from her. Yes, yeah, you should have done. Yeah. But I know what you're saying. You know, in what I'm hearing in your voice is the frustration. And not having the not having it exactly as you wanted, and I think that's the frustration for ghost hunters generally going into locations where they're not derelict or you know or they're owned by somebody else mm. is that they weren't you know we're not in a position to be able to dictate and say hey look can we have you know the location as we want it so that we can capture all the best footage and the best photos. It's it's a little bit frustrating. The frustration but, of it is is that I've been back there so many times and I can't replicate it. Right. I've just put the link to our EVP page on, so you can listen to it whenever you want. Okay, I'll but, have a look at that. You know, one. Um, but that's the more more annoying part of it: the fact that we've never been able to replicate it, even the tapping, uh, the tap stripping, or anything like that. Right. You know, that's the most igno uh, you know annoying bit. You know, you'd think yes. that it would happen again over the years, but it didn't. Do you think it's frustrating though to be in that situation and to, as we are? essentially where we get all ghost hunters that we're looking for evidence and then you get some what appears to be amazing evidence where a little girl's voice leaves a warning on an EVP that says I'm going to show you and then what she shows you is a dripping tap. Yeah. You just want, you know, you want more than that, <laughs> don't this you? This is it. It's the same with the orb um, debate. Yes. Um, you know, okay, I, I, I do love the members coming on and showing me orbs and stuff but they're so ten a penny, aren't yeah. they? And they're so, you know, you can explain away an orb, yeah. and you know. Yeah. And when a member's done it and it's not on your investigation. You don't you, know what to think. You don't know about the yes. environment or anything. So all you can say to them is, yeah, that looks that looks really good. But yeah. you don't know whether it's moist, what the atmosphere, what the temperature was during the day or anything. So you're, exactly. you're lost. Yes. Like you say, it's not under your control. No. No, no this is it. But, you know, there's it could a, be anything. Yeah. 
We have some more questions yeah. for you. Uh, okay. <laughs> I have, uh, I'll, I'll save my question for, for a minute. Because if they disappear on, on the chat room, we, we, we lose them. Uh, okay. Jamie was asking, in general, your opinion of, uh, of Ouija boards and the fact they're actually in, in toy shops. Uh, good question, Jamie. Um, my opinion of, of Ouija boards is that they are a psychological nightmare. So I think it's all down to psychology. Mm -hmm. However, do I think they should be for sale in toy shops? No. no. And that might seem that I'm being contradictory, but it's simply because I know of the psychological side to it. I know of the natural explanations for why Ouija boards work. However, if you've got a very strong belief in these things and a very strong belief in the negative side of Ouija boards, all it takes is somebody who's who has an experience with a Ouija board that may then uh, affect them quite negatively. It doesn't have to be paranormal, but because it feeds into their belief system, it, it might actually affect them in, in a negative way. Um, and so I'm always very wary when I hear about Ouija boards being sold in, in toy shops. And also people often say to me, do you think people should use Ouija boards given that they're so negative? Well, no, if you've got that belief in them, then don't use them. Yeah. But ultimately, Ouija boards, even at the turn of the century in the early 1900s, well-known psychical researchers were using them in haunting investigations and sounds rooms. And they knew that all they were, Ouija boards, was a way of tapping into your unconscious. But it wasn't about communication with spirit. It was about tapping into your unconscious. And the whole negative association of Ouija boards, unfortunately, has come from the 1960s uh, from uh, Satanism and Satanism kind of latching onto the Ouija board as a as a portal to hell, basically. And it's as, and it's as it's as far fetched as it sounds, but that's the absolute truth. You look at the history of Ouija boards, and it wasn't initially negative. It's only really over the last 40 years or so that the negative side has uh, has come to the fore. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you two. Two quick questions, and, and, and hopefully your, your answers can be quick, because uh, then I've got um, one of my own to ask you. Uh, okay. John would like to know, have you ever, have you ever investigated uh, Alcatraz? And if not, would you like to? Uh, no, I haven't, and I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone would. <laughs> and, and Andy wants, wants to know, uh, uh, excuse the uh, pronunciation, have you, what's your opinion of Constanfin's Rudiv. Rudiv. Uh, Constantine, book. Yeah. Constantine uh, Rawdiv and Breakthrough. Um, Rawdiv is one of the original EVP researchers. He's the basically himself and Jurgensen are the guys that got us involved in EVP all those years ago. Breakthrough book, uh, fantastic. However, um, I wouldn't recommend it to everybody. It's a huge book. It's extremely technical. Some fascinating stuff in there, but it's quite a heavy read. Uh, but there are some other nice summaries of EVP stuff out there. David Ellis has written a book, The Mediumship of the Tape Recorder, which is quite good. And then some modern EVP stuff, which is good. But yeah, great question, Andy. And uh, lots of respect for Rowdy and Jurgensen and Breakthroughs. Okay. Yeah, the, uh, my question now, there's a, there's a gentleman in America and... He'll have to forgive me because I can never remember his name, but Sue knows it. Oh, David Ramsey. David Ramsey. It, they're doing a lot of uh, experiments with uh, uh, EMF, and they've come to the conclusion that uh, there's a big connection with uh, EVPs, and that it's actually the EVP that's causing the EMF. It's EMF that's causing the EVPs. What's your theory? That's an that's an interesting. Interesting idea. I'd like to know how they're measuring the EMF because what well, they might be tapping into, if they're measuring EMF using a K2, uh, K2 can pick up on many different signals. It can pick up on Wi-Fi. It can pick up on walkie-talkies. Uh, it can pick up on mobile phones. It can pick up on a number of different sources. Yeah, I might be able to help, I might be able to help you there because the uh, this is not a group. This is a, a big... Uh, it's... Yeah. Um, SP investigations, apparently. Yeah, but they're not actually a group. They're using all, all the top 
uh, equipment and everything. To, oh, okay. To well, then, yeah, thing. I'd love to see what they. I'd love to see what they're doing. Okay. Again, it's, it's even even though it's you know it's it's not a group and they're using top of the range equipment. Yeah. I'd just like to know what it is they're doing. Uh, can you yeah. Can you sounds it sounds sounds feasible, mm -hmm. but what levels of EMF they're talking about and what the source of those EMF readings are. Yeah means that there could be interference on EVP and actually cause of it. Yeah, that's I'll the, try and find the uh, link for you and the, send it to you. That, that's, part, okay, that's part of what they're coming up with. Uh, recently, we've actually uh, tried to do something similar just to, to see, if, see if we can replicate it uh, by using a, an EMF pump. And oh, yes. It, we do seem to get more responses with the EMF in the room. I mean, obviously, it's not throwing out masses of, e of EMF to affect people in the room, but we do seem to get... But it affects it in some way. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just, it's all research at the end of the day to see what happens. Um, it's like with all the gadgets that we use. They're not really for this sort of thing, are they? So. No, and like you said, it's just testing, isn't it? You're mm. just exploring, That's really, at the end of the day. Right. So, and uh, we, we have Kaz Jasper in the chat room, right. and she was wondering what you thought of the stone tape theory. Uh, stone tape theory, uh, just to summarise for listeners that don't know, this idea that the fabric of the building almost acts as a recorder, a recording device, and it plays back uh, often very emotional circumstances, but will play back um, the the almost the footage of the residents that were in a location before. So it's almost as though the stone of a building is like uh, a tape recorder and it's just playing it back and you're actually seeing a playback instead of a ghost that's visiting. So you're seeing a recording. Um, it's an interesting theory, uh, mm -hmm. fascinating theory, in fact, and it's, and it's one that I've heard a lot of. It's interesting also where it comes from that it actually comes from a 1970s television play written by a guy called Nigel Neal um, called The Stone Tape Theory. Uh, prior to that, I think there were references to a similar theory, the water tape theory, I think yeah. it was. Um, but Stone Tape Theory, that's really where it started. Uh, they're all theories. Um, and my argument as a scientist would be, how do you test something like that? Well, there's a lot of um, uh, remarks on, I've noticed of late where people are saying about ghosts and stuff like that. Why don't we see cavemen and, and, and things? It's like, I think, when it comes to like the Loch Ness Monster, that maybe back in the day it was a replay sort of thing and and it's just worn out. You know, that's why we're not seeing it so much. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, it's it's... It's an interesting argument why we don't see more historical mm. figures, and yet somebody like Richard Felix would turn around and go, "Well, go up to York, and you see, you hear about uh, f sightings of Roman ghosts, you know, and yeah. the, and there are ghosts of periods going back a lot further." But for me, as a skeptic and a psychologist, as well as a parapsychologist, I'd say, well, the reason why. The reason why we don't see more ghosts from earlier parts in history might be down to what history periods we're familiar with. Hmm. Do you, would you yeah. say that the media, mainly TV, has been good or bad for the field of paranormal? paranormal? The what TV? The Sorry, the, would you say that the media, right, oh, yes. mainly TV, has been good or bad for the field of the paranormal? Both. Both. I would say. I say. I would say the good side is. Uh, that we're talking now, uh, yeah. we, we, you know, the the field of ghost hunting has just exploded, and I think there's a good side to that is that we're all meeting each other, we're meeting people with with different interests. There's there's good research going on out there from various groups. There's good discussion going on. It's made it okay to talk about this stuff rather than it being a you know geeky behind closed doors endeavor that it was over 10 years ago people are, are a lot more open about it and fascinated by it and i think that's brilliant we've got more magazines more books more internet pages more dvds more stuff about it than we ever have and, and i really I'm, i know they get i know but, they get a lot of stick um 
whether it be good or bad, but I think you can actually um, thank Most Haunted for most of it. To um, be truthful. I don't, you know, it's, yes, it's brought I, it I, back I, into the eye and, it you know, it got it out there. Yeah, there's there's definite shows beforehand, Strange mm. But True yeah. and uh, Ghost Watch that came out as well and various shows that were before, but you're right, it had such a huge impact yeah. on it. And, and I know colleagues have uh, surveyed the number of groups that are around you know, e over a decade ago, and you've got an e exponential increase from maybe 100, 200 groups, if that, around the country up to now 2,000 and still counting, and, and maybe even a lot more than that. And so it has had a, an impact in that way, and I think that's a good thing, but yeah. then I think there's also the bad thing. Where do you think is the I most think. haunted area in the UK? The most haunted area? Mm. <laughs> they say Derby is the most haunted area. They say York. What, what do you think? Where do you think? Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's a tough one. But, um, <laughs> well, you're going to have to... For, in my, uh, it, okay, here's a logical answer. We, you're going to have to go for a city. Pardon? Have to, you're going to have to go for a city. Yeah. Anyway from a purely logical point of view, because there are more buildings that are potentially haunted in a city. Okay. And go for a larger city, London. London. So the number of buildings that there are there. And yeah. The so that would be a logical answer. My heart, uh -huh. however, my heart says that it's a toss-up between Liverpool and Edinburgh. Really? Really? There you go, Jamie said Liverpool. <laughs> 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 um, are there any other areas of the paranormal you are interested in investigating apart from, you know, the ghost side of it? Are you interested in... Um... Oh, yeah. I do I do a lot of research outside of ghost hunting. I mentioned at the beginning about uh, psychic detection. Yes. Psychic detectives. I do a lot of psychic criminology work. But also I do a lot in an area that I call Christian parapsychology, so researching stigmata, possessions, miracle blood, that sort of thing. Mm. And, um, and also even the demonology side as well. It's very much the fringe areas of parapsychology. You wouldn't find a lot of academic study on it, but um, I just find it fascinating. Have you ever witnessed an exorcism? Yes. Do you feel, as a, are you a sceptical about it or...? Yes, I, I am very sceptical about it. Um, I've met with a number of, well, I shouldn't say exorcists. They call themselves healing ministers. Right. Uh, this was about 12, 13 years ago when I was invited along to a training session. Uh, I turned up expecting to find one of those first aid dummies lying on a stretcher and people actually performing exorcisms on a dummy, but it ended up being a day where exorcists and healing ministers talked about their war stories. Mm. Generally, uh, they were very sensible people, and they, they worked a lot with psychiatrists because they were aware of the alternative explanations for what's going on uh, to do with epilepsy, but also various disorders. So I have a lot of respect for them when they do that, but then there's also the, the, the population of exorcists who will just barrel into a place and perform an exorcist simply at the wish of somebody without any knowledge of the psychology. Right. Well, I, excuse me for saying this, but I yep. could talk to you for hours on end because you've got so <laughs> much knowledge about ghost hunting and, you know, the best way, the bad way, you know, the good bad ways, you know, what we should do, what we shouldn't do and, and all in the, you know, in, in the work that we should be doing with it you know, and, and what gadgets not to use. And it, it's so interesting. And uh, I know for a fact that I, you know, we've did, it's been nearly an hour now talking to you. So I don't really want to keep you on too long, Kieran. I really do appreciate you talking to us. But um, one thing I do want to ask you is yeah. ghost lands. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> What's going on? Give what, us a scoop. Give us a scoop. What's happening? <laughs> it's all coming up when? It, uh, I can't say any more other than it's coming up Halloween evening. Okay. Is it it's, on TV? It's a project that I've been working on now for over a year with my wife. Um, it's taken uh, a lot to put it together. Mm -hmm. And there'll be more announcements coming over the next couple of days. Um, Tuesday onwards, it'll become a, a 
I would say, a lot more clearer what's happening. But all I can say at this stage is keep your Halloween evening free. And how is it on? Is it going to be on TV or on online? I can't say. Oh right, okay, but it, we will know, won't we? You will you let will us know. know. Yes, yes, you will know as we approach Halloween. You'll know more. Right, uh, okay. So we're sorry just to be gonna, mysterious. Keep out an eye out on your website. Is it ghostlands.co.uk? Yes. Well, ghostlands.co.uk is where the countdown clock is, mm-hmm. and that's counting down to Halloween evening. Uh, people can look on Facebook, Ghostlands, and Twitter at ghost underscore lands for uh, upcoming information about what's happening. Right. And is there a possibility of Most Haunted coming up, coming back? There's so much... Gossip around. Yeah, well, as I understand it, as I understand it, the team or Carl and Yvette are putting something together again. Uh, um, on the, uh, as I understand it, through the, the through the rumor mill. Yeah. Uh, not sure what's happening. Okay. Uh, I know they're putting something together, and somebody mentioned a couple of weeks ago that they had been uh, filming. So yeah, I'm sure they're trying to get it back on. Oh, good. And th- and just going back to Ghostlands, is this going to be a one-off or is this coming, you know, is, is, is there other projects that you've got going on at the moment? Um, this is the project that I'm working on at the moment. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a big project. Um, there are other things that I'm working on, which is more in terms of writing, in terms of uh, books, various books that are coming out and various articles, but in terms of Ghostlands and any more beyond Halloween, watch this space. Okay. And would you ever go on an investigation with any groups? Yes. No, I'm happy to go on investigations with groups. I get inquiries a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, The only thing that restricts it is really geography and my schedule. It's as simple as that. Um, Okay. But I do occasionally... If there are local groups or I happen to be in a particular part of the country, if I happen to be in a particular part of the country, then I'll go, uh, you know, and, and see if there are any local ghost hunts or local ghost groups. And so I am very keen to see and meet groups that are out there. Um, That's good then. I work with a number um, or have worked with a number uh, already. I've worked with the pigs who I heard did a bit of advertisement on your Yep. Go oh, earlier on. Tim Brown, yeah. Tim Brown, yeah. Work with Tim and Amy, a brilliant group. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm happy to take right. inquiries from people. Right. Well, just two things before you go. Uh, yep. Has Jasper said that uh, she wants to know whether you've ever investigated a battlefield? Um, if he hasn't already been, he, you should go to Colondon. Colondon. Colondon battlefield. Colondon battlefield. Yeah, yes. Very a, creepy. It's a place I'd love to go to. I've investigated a couple of battlefields in Fr- in northern France, mm-hmm. um, but in terms of the UK, uh, no, I'd love to to visit Culloden Battlefield. Really would, and it's in. It's meant to be extremely haunted. Right. Uh, Andy wants to know if you did go on at other people's events, do they have to pay you? <laughs> it depends. If I'm, it, it depends. If it I'm depends. in the area, yeah. Uh, you know, like I said, geography. If I'm in the area. Yeah. And I've got a free evening. Then I I have done in the past. I've always popped along to an investigation or a discussion that a group discussion night that a group are having, just to find out what's going on there and just yeah. keep <coughs> keep my my nose in, as it were. Um, yeah. So no, if I'm around, then they. Well, if you ever if, if it's an event, if it's a public event, that's yeah. a di- different case. But yeah, okay. just a group is fine. Right. Um. Well, you can always have a look on our website. <laughs> but um, as I say, um, if anyone's got any pictures or EVPs or something like that, where should they send them? Can they send them to you? <laughs> yeah, they can. They won't get a very quick reply. No, that, I'm sure you're busy. <laughs> loads. There are loads that come through. But if you send it through to the best address would be inquiries, mm-hmm. it's E-N, inquiries, at theparapsychologist.com Right, okay, you've heard that. So, if you ever want to send anything to uh, Kieran, um, please give him time to look because um, he's obviously a busy man. (laughs) Very busy man, aren't you? (laughs) Yes, a very busy man. And uh, 
Um, if you do send an orb, just be prepared for the reply. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, Kieran, it's been really good having you on. Um, this has been a relaxed interview. Um, hopefully, we'll get you on again sometime. Yes, love to. Andy said nice website, by the way. Uh, Andy said you've got a nice website, by the oh, way. Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice and clear. <laughs> but uh, as I say, um, you know, uh, we're here at uh, the KTPF, actually stands for Keeping the Paranormal Friendly, which we try to do quite a lot. So, um, as I say, um, so if if you have anything that you need to advertise or a book or anything like that, if you want to email it to us, we'll let everybody know, um, we'll let our listeners know um, what's going on in your in your neck of the woods. So, please keep That'd us informed. Great. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Steve and Suzanne. It's been lovely. You're welcome. So, hopefully we'll meet up someday. Yes, look forward to it. Okay, well, take care, my love, and... Okay. Uh, don't be a stranger. I won't do. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, there you go, Kieran O'Keefe. Um, I think I was a little bit nervous talking to him, really. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, um, very nice man and uh, not a Derek in sight. Um, but uh, no. you know, so I just thank him for his time. So, it, uh, so what did you think, then, ladies um, and gentlemen? Uh, did you enjoy that? And he says, why nervous? <laughs> I don't know. I just felt a bit nervous. I think it was the same as I felt when I had uh, Ben Anson on. Um, thank you for all your time. Uh, so, uh, Andy, I'm trying to work out your comment you, you put earlier. You put, I'm sure it didn't start with Neil. And I just put Neil. I'm confused on that one. Nervous can can you enlighten us? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. You fancy, fancy Ben? <laughs> no, no, I don't fancy him. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you for your, for having me. So, I said, I just said thank you for your time. He said, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Have a good night. And to you too, if you're still listening, Kieran. So, um, right, well, it was really good, wasn't it? So, uh, <laughs> um, but hopefully the next time we have him on, I won't be so nervous. <laughs> but uh, uh, Poppy's enjoyed the show. She's been quite quiet there, hasn't she? Yeah. D six says fantastic show. D, where have you been? Well, <laughs> Do uh, I know D? <laughs> can I just clarify what I asked about Neil? He's just come back and said uh, Nigel Neil, the author. Mm. Yeah, he didn't clarify it earlier. All oh, right. Okay. He, he just said it didn't start with Neil, and it just confused me because he didn't know which Neil we oh, were right. talking about. Oh right. Okay, okay. So uh, that that was um, Kieran O'Keefe. It's been brilliant. Um, D, do I know you? Are you the D we know and love? Um, if not, I'm sure we know and lo uh, love you either way for being on uh, the show. Yeah, we've all left. So, um, <laughs> but I hope you've enjoyed it tonight. It's been um, very interesting. Uh, sorry, spelt Neil wrong. It's it's Neil, as in K E N E A L E. Yes, you do, Drake Low. All right. Yes, you do, Drake Low. So, I didn't know. Is it D. Clark? <laughs> um, just let me know. Uh, don't forget, you can join our, face, uh, our, our Facebook page if you wish. Um, oh. <laughs> it's spelled Keneal. Yeah, Keneal. <laughs> and don't forget, we do have a forum. You can always go on there. I've got to really update it, um, to be honest with you. But, uh, you know, Jamie's summon enjoyed every minute of it. And... Um, all right, Nigel Keneal. Yeah, I have to uh, say Keneal, then we're not what we're on about. But uh, if you ever want to have a look at this um, SP um, stuff that uh, that they're um, researching, you can have a look there. There's quite, when it comes up, right. there's quite a lot on there for you to do, um, to have a look at. And... Um, yeah, and uh, the, uh, the author, Nigel Neal, uh, spelt with a K, uh, it, it, and he's put the website up for it's uh, wikipedia.org forward slash wiki forward slash Nigel space Neil spelt K N E A L E. If anybody wants to go and have a look, yes. So, uh, it, as I say, it's all been good fun, and I'm going to turn that down a sec because otherwise, you'll hear that I've got mal. <laughs> Um, next week, she says, hold on, ah, coming he's soon, he's best known for Quatermaster. is he? Right, well next week ladies and gentlemen, we have um, a young man coming on, um, who's going to be talking about 
quite a bit of stuff, actually. His name's Alien Bill. Oh, don't ask. <laughs> That's his nickname, by the way. That's his nickname, yeah. Um, let me see. I'm just going to tell you a bit about that. He has around 48,000 photographs that he's put into a book, yeah, um, of pa on paranormal and cosmic connections. Um, he's writing a book which will be out next year. Um, he's going to come on and talk to us about it. And um, for the past five years, um, no, I don't want to tell you that bit. <laughs> Recently, I've been out in one out on to one of my fields and took 350 photographs of a blue mist life form that comes to me. I have thousands of these. So um, since 2013, uh, things have happened that he's going to tell us about anyway. Um, so uh, that should be interesting. So hopefully. It's a bit of everything, isn't it? It's yes. what it's all about. Yes, Paranormal really. covers everything, you know. So, um, you know, we're going to have a word with him, you know, and he's going to tell us all about his research and uh, all these UFO things he's caught and um, about his story. Mm. So uh, that will so, so, be good. So, sounds a bit like he might be going down... Uh, Nigel's uh, neck of the woods. It could be, yes. Portals, portals things, but, and uh, stuff like that. We shall so. see. And I don't think all, all of the pictures are in the book, Jamie, so it's it's not going to be that thick. I think the book. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, it, it's what we talk about, isn't it? We cut, try and cover everything. And, um, you know, so... and. But who have we got on after Alien Bill? What after? Yeah, what, give, not give, next week. Give him a teaser. A teaser after Alien Bill. We have Mark Rosney. Hey, Mark's coming in. And uh, does, that, does that mean? Uh, never know. We might have Roy Basnet um, back. Roy might come in with him. I can't remember what Roy Bas uh, Mark's talking about, but it, it's going to be paranormal. Then on the seventeenth, we've got the Cage. Yes. What's the right that link for? Spirit Investigations was about the um, research they're doing. Um, EVP project, the Orb project, oh, the EVP etc. Yeah. So that's what I gave you that for. Okay. Um, just in case you want to have a look, uh, we've got the cage. That's something we're going to be doing next Saturday. Yes. Um, I'm got next Saturday. Yes, we're going to be down at the cage. Uh, no, we're not. No, we're we're going to be at Draco. No, we're going to Draco. Um, and he's going to the cage. Yeah, we're <laughs> going to be at Draco, and we're going to be doing this. Um, the lone vigil. Lone vigil thing. Not so a lot please of people. Go not to the uh, the the. Uh, Are there anyone sponsored us? Go to the just just giving website. Uh, is it forward slash Suzanne? Don't I'll I'll put it on there. No, nope. stick it on there, girl. Not many people have sponsored us, but I don't know. Uh, well. If you raise a little bit, it's good enough. But it's for Blesma, which is the um, helping limbless servicemen and women, service and ex-servicemen and women. So that's what it's all about. Uh, I'll put the put the thing on there for you. If you do want to sponsor sponsor me, it all goes straight to Blesma. Um, and uh, have I got Blesma's? Here we go. I'll just get this, and that will tell you about Blesma. Okay, um, and we're going to be there with this haunted painting, apparently. I'm dreading it, to be honest with you. Yes, we uh, went to... Um, <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are getting some disc, and we're going to uh, record it. What The thing is, right, <laughs> and, I went to, we went to this MBS, and, didn't we, last year? And, you, and, uh, last you, week. and you never know, we might actually put it up on the site for you to look yeah. at. Yeah, we went to the MBS last week, we and um, what happened was... Uh, one of our old ex-members, who can't be with us anymore because he's got other things to do, um, <laughs> he um, he said to me, I saw it on there that you're going to do it. And he said, I remember when we were down there once and you were walking around the tunnels with this torch. And I went, yeah. And he said, uh, the thing is, the torch your, your torch batteries went and all we could hear in, was this voice going, help, anybody there? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm dreading it. Twenty uh, fourth of November, uh, we have Richard Freeman back on, a friend of ours, talking about his research and um, looking for the Tasmanian wolf. So a bit of cryptozoology there, and uh, and then on the first of uh, 
December. God, we're in December. Uh, we've got a young lady coming on talking about a book. Um, the House on Poultry Road. So that would be good. And then Neil Arnold. He's coming on to um, talk about things like um, the ghost of Bluebell Hill and stuff. Because he deals with all that. Yeah, they're, they're just doing walks up there now, aren't they? Yeah. And Jackie Newcomb will be on as well on the 15th of December. She's coming back. And then we're going shamanism on the 22nd of December. Then we might have a break until after the new year. So hopefully we'll get some more people on. But uh, for now, um, unfortunately, we've got to say goodbye. It's time to this go. is where it's at. Yeah. So uh, we hope you'll see us all next week. And um, I'd like to come on again and talk about something or other. Yes, we want yes. you back on, Andy, to talk about something yes. or other. Just just let us know what the, uh, uh, what other the issue we is. want to talk about, yes. and we'll work it out. And we'll get you on just after 10 o'clock, half past 10. <laughs> he said he may have to make it up. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we'll do that. And um, as I say, it's uh, it's all good fun. Those of you who don't know about the cage, we're going to be put streaming live about 4 o'clock, 4.30. The show's coming on at 8.30. You've then got to tell the guy what to do because he'll be watching it um, live. We'll be going backwards and forwards to see what he's doing and, and you can tell him where to go and what to do and, and stuff. And um, it should be good. And it's all for charity. So uh, it should be good. Zombies, mice on Mars. Yeah, all right. Uh, no, 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 <laughs> not Mars, please. So... Um, Jamie, uh, if you could be on Skype in a bit, I'd like to have a quick word, if that's okay. And uh, until next week, um, and don't forget, I will tell you about uh, what we're doing on Friday next week as well. So, uh, and if we don't do it, we'll still tell you what, what it's all about. But it's all to do with a, a hundred odd year old murder, isn't it? That it, was, it is was never solved. Nin so, uh, 1909. Oh, nine. Oh, nine. Was you, yeah, it actually yeah. happened. So uh, we'll tell you more about that next week. But until then, I'm afraid it's time for us to go. So good night and God bless and uh, have a good week. And enjoy your Halloween. So take care. And don't forget, guys. Keep the paranormal, paranormal friendly. friendly. Good night and God bless. Thank you. To see in the night, to measure the spike, to see how cold it's been. I buy my kit so I won't forget the ghosties that I have seen. The Paranormal Intelligence Gathering Services Ghost Store. So visit www.the-pigs.co.uk forward slash ghost store. <laughs> <laughs>